thank you for uh, to all the senior staff and working so hard to help us prepare for all these budget hearings, particularly today. We know there's a lot of moving parts as we consider uh, the American Rescue Plan funding and how we can best allocate that to address the critical needs of our community. Uh, Dave, welcome. Take it away. Okay. Good morning, Mayor. Yeah, thank you. And first, we'll get into uh, fees and charges and the capital program, and then we'll jump into the uh, recovery session. So. Uh, Staff is here for any questions or comments on fees and charges. Okay, let's this, is, this is Tony City Clerk. Should we do roll call? Oh, good point, Tony. Why don't we do roll call? <laughs> Jimenez? <laughs> Jimenez? Morales? Here. Cohen? Here. Roscoe? Present. Davis? Here. Esparza? Okay, cool. Arenas? Here. Foley? Here. Mayhem? Here. Jones? Present. Licardo? Present. Okay. Okay, now we're really here. Sorry, better. Okay, great. So uh, we're starting with. Coming to this, this first section, at least. If I could ask, Inap, could you please uh, mute? Thank you. Um, it will now begin with fees and charges. So if there are any questions from my colleagues uh, about fees and charges, and we'll go to the public, see if there are any questions about fees and charges. All right, I see no hands. I see one hand, uh, Rebecca Armandaris. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Council members. I'm wondering about um, public comment in general. Will it be taken after every different subject matter or? Um, yeah, we have three topic. subjects we're covering, uh, fees and charges, capital budget, and then the uh, ARP and related funding. So we'll, we'll, do, uh, we'll do public input on each of these categories. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, other questions, comments? Okay, I, I had um, one one question on uh, development fees and specifically, um, I know that we've been mightily challenged in various ways um, around uh, uh, throughput, particularly on fire. Um, on the development side, and I don't know if anybody from the fire department's with us. Nope. Okay. If yes, not, Mayor. I see. I see Hector is here. On. Yep. Okay. Great. Hey, Hector. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Um, Hector, I, I just wanted to understand. Do do we? I know we've had challenges with vacancy around fire inspectors and and throughput in that space. Are we now at a fee level that is sufficient to enable us to get the people in place? Uh, thank you for the question, Mayor. Uh, yes, actually, I'd say that uh, right now we're we're in a really good place uh, based on the short, medium, and long-term uh, plan that we had that we enacted uh, over a year ago. So we've been able to hire uh, key people. So with engineers, we're at full staff now. Um, we have uh, three vacancies that we're filling currently for hazmat inspectors. So we also have the uh, retiree rehires uh, as inspectors, and we also have peak staffing resources. So we, we built up a lot of resilience. So I'd say that when it comes to workflows at the moment, we're looking at being able to address any of those uh, predictable times during the year. So there's one in fall and then there's one um, in uh, late spring that we expect a, a rise in addition to every three years when the code cycle changes. So. I would say um, we're at a good place. We, you can get an inspection of any type within uh, a day, if not two. And uh, our plan check uh, backlog, which what we defined as how long did it take? And we are working towards the, uh, the standard of 10 days for initial and five days for a, um, a resubmittal. So we're doing well. Um, I think we have the right number of people on board. Uh, and as long as, and we also initiated some, some uh, um, training programs that are way more structured. So we have the ability to onboard people more quickly. 
So I would say that uh, based on the current budget uh, and the projections for our fees, this actually puts us in a really good place to um, move forward. So with regard to opening back up uh, and then getting used to the um, new electronic submission uh, for, um, for projects, um, I, I, think we're, I think we're in a good place to be able to uh, maintain um, those numbers. And I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you, Hector. So is it, is it fair to say then we've cleared the backlog at this point? I would say that, yes. That's great news. Okay. Well, thank you for, for all your work on that. I know that's been a, a tough pain point. Um, Council Member Foley? Oh, I'm sorry, Hector, forgive me. No, I was going to say it feels good to be here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> We've come a long way. Uh, Council Member Foley? Great. Thank you, Mayor. That was one of the questions I had, actually. So that, that takes one on my list. I just have a couple questions. One is with uh, OED and cultural affairs regarding the film and photography section. Is that uh, for companies who want to film movies and things like that here? And what kind of demand? I see this as a new fee, so I'm just curious what kind of a demand and what triggered the need for this fee? Um, Good morning, Nancy Klein, Office of Economic Development, and I believe Carrie should be on, but um, council member, thank you very much for the question. Many communities have a very advanced um, uh, fee associated with filming. And prior to the pandemic, there were more requests uh, and we're lucky to have a staff person who came from the LA area, so was bringing to us more of what she had implemented in that LA area. So, so that's the notion and I will get you more details shortly so that we um, can tell you exactly where the demand has been, council member. Great, I think it's a great idea and I love to see San Jose on TV or in the movies. Can we get a, a fee every time they say the name San Jose and they don't take a picture of us of San Jose? Well, actually, they what's don't that, say us our name. Good, the, good, the good doctor or something, doesn't that say they film in San Jose? And it does, actually. really don't. <laughs> yeah, why don't we get any money for that? <laughs> Shouldn't we? It's a new profit center, I think. Um, the it. next question I had to do, had, uh, was regarding the water utility. Oh, no, before I get to that, there was an increase in the affordable housing impact fee from 1870 a square foot to 1915 per square foot. I know the ordinance says we can increase that annually. Does the, I didn't do the math. So does this conform to the math calculation allowed in the ordinance? Uh, Mark Gerhardt, the uh, uh, admin officer for the Department of Housing. Uh, yes, it does. This is the uh, built-in automatic uh, inflation uh, multiplier that gets uh, applied to the fee each year. Okay, good. Thank you. I just wanted to confirm that. And the other is um, under un other fee revisions, uh, there's a paragraph that talks about the increase in Recycle Plus at 17% and then a... a 9% revenue adjustment to the water utility fund. Maybe I should know what the water utility fund is, but can you tell me what the water utility fund is? Uh, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Carrie Romano with Environmental Services. That's uh, the municipal water system. Okay. And we're, uh, when, it, when it says, not, thank you, when it says a 9% revenue adjustment, I don't know if that's up or down. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's up. Okay, uh, so <laughs> because the others say up, up, increase, increase, and this just says an adjustment. So that's an increase, uh, uh, an adjustment upwards. Yeah, Jeff Provenzano. Jeff, do you want to add any context to that? Um, sure, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, Jeff Provenzano, Deputy Director for Municipal Water System. Uh, yes, unfortunately, that is a revenue adjustment up. Uh, there are a couple drivers to our, our costs and, and why uh, we need a higher revenue. It's actually it's driven by higher costs. Uh, primarily, the, the two big ones are wholesale water rates and COVID-related revenue shortfall. So, yeah, that, that recommendation is to in, increase that, uh, that revenue higher to cover those costs. Okay. Great. Thank you. Those are the only questions I had. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, other questions from my colleagues? Okay, I think we'll, um, we'll move on then to the capital program. And there's no presentation here, is that right, Dave? That's correct, Mayor. Yes, yeah, so we're no. we stand ready for any questions or comments on the capital no. program. Sorry, sorry, Dave. Actually, we uh, this, is, oh. this is Jim Shannon, the budget director. We actually do have a, a presentation worked up for the capital program. Um, should be should be should be posted there. Okay. Um, if oh, if that's all right, let's go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I love the CIP too much. We have to have a presentation for that. So, um, uh, Mayor and Council, uh, uh, good morning. So, I want to introduce. Um, Matt, Matt Kano, the Public Works Director, who will be leading the second half of the presentation, but for the first half of the presentation on the capital program, I want to introduce Chris Yee, our uh, Assistant to the City Manager and Capital Budget Coordinator in the Budget Office, a new, new, new to the city, started in Feb February, um, so I want to uh, thank him for his work on his first CIP here and uh, turn the floor over to him to start off with the presentation. Chris. Thank you, Jim. Uh, one moment, I'm going to share the presentation here. Okay. Okay, so good morning, Mayor and Council members. Uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, my name is Chrissy, a new Capital Coordinator in the City's Budget Office. I'm very happy to be here this morning before the council uh, to provide a summary of the 2021-22 proposed capital budget uh, and broader 2022-26 capital improvement program. After a quick overview of the proposed budget and the CIP, as well as going over all of the major revenue sources that provide funding for capital projects, I'll turn it over to Matt Kano, uh, Director of Public Works for the second half of the presentation for him to provide an overview of the, uh, the city's uh, 14 capital programs. Uh, this first slide, uh, should, everyone should be familiar with the, the city's so six different city service areas uh, and everything obviously that the city does fall into one of the six areas and the capital work is no exception. Uh, there are 14 capital programs uh, that the city administers and the slide shows where each capital program belongs to. There's a slide later in the presentation that addresses the general principle behind how each capital, uh, capital program is developed for each cycle. But the main source that guides us, of course, is the Envision San Jose 2040 general plan. And obviously a robust capital program is absolutely critical in helping achieving uh, the goals listed in that plan. Uh, this is a slide that you saw in last week's operating budget presentation. Uh, just to briefly recap, the city's proposed budget for 21.2 is approximately 4.5 billion with roughly a half of the budget in special funds and about a quarter each for the general fund and capital funds. Uh, the proposed capital budget uh, is about 1.23 billion uh, for 21.22. Uh, it represents a decrease of about 13% uh, when compared to the 2020-21 adopted capital budget of 1.4 billion. But please do keep in mind that, that there are, there's still additional new budgets that haven't been accounted for yet. So after those have been fully captured, uh, it is expected that the final 21-22 adopted capital budget number to be so more or less in line with or even slightly exceeding the last year's adopted number. Uh, this next slide is the historical comparison of the five-year CIP numbers. As you can see, the proposed five-year CIP is 3.5 billion uh, on the far right, and other bars in blue represent uh, the prior year adopted CIP numbers. Uh, generally speaking, the five-year CIP numbers have been going up over the years. Our local region and the country as a whole were all recovering from the Great Recession into early parts of the last decade. And as the economy covered and continued to expand, the city's financial situation also got better and our overall capital investment dollars went up accordingly. Our uh, five-year CIP peaked uh, two years ago at uh, 4 billion. And a uh, big reason for that was the introduction of the Measure T funding uh, being built into the five-year CIP for the first time after uh, voters approved that measure uh, in November of 2018. And um, while this year's proposed CIP is lower at 2.5 billion, 
But once all of the remaining budgets have been accounted for, uh, the final adopted CIP number should be in line with or slightly larger than the last year's adopted CIP of 3.7 billion. For the CI, uh, city's CIP, there are seven different categories of funding sources uh, uh, that are listed on this table. But really, the top five funding sources that you see here, uh, financing for seeds, contributions and loans and transfers, revenue from other agencies, taxes and fees and charges, and beginning fund balances account for almost all of the CIP at just over 98%. I'll go through and highlight each of these major five funding sources quickly in more detail uh, over in the next few slides. Okay, largest uh, source of uh, funding for the CIP is uh, debt that the city issues. Uh, it's a little bit more than 1.1 billion. The Water Pollution Control Capital Program accounts for almost 700 for implementing uh, various uh, capital projects recommended by the master plan for the regional wastewater facility. Uh, the next one is Measure T at just over 400 million to provide funding for various public safety, infrastructure, and other facility improvement projects across uh, five different capital programs. And the remaining 15.9 million, it consists of 8.3 million in commercial paper for the parks capital program to fund the remediation projects related to 2017 flood. And the other 7.6 million in bond pursuits is to fund various facility improvements at central service yards. Second largest funding source category is contributions, loans, and transfers at just over 700 million over five years. Uh, as you can see, by far the largest uh, contributions or transfers are coming from the special funds at almost uh, 617 million. And roughly two thirds of that is coming from the sewer service and use charge fund to two different capital programs, water pollution capital, uh, water pollution control capital program, and also the sanitary sewer system capital program. And the other major transfers coming from special funds include uh, 130 plus million from the airport surplus revenue fund, uh, 27 million coming from the water utility fund, uh, and uh, 26 million coming from the storm sewer operating fund. Uh, and speaking of the storm sewer, uh, its capital program is facing a significant funding declines in the out years of the CIP. And this is because the storm sewer surplus charge that has remained uh, basically flat over the past decade or so while its storm sewer operating cost has been steadily going up. Uh, so with this operating cost going up each year, but the revenues remaining flat, uh, we have a less and less funding available for its capital program. Uh, so identifying a more sustainable funding source will be uh, one of the top priorities for this capital program in the near future. Uh, and besides the special funds, uh, contributions or transfers coming from the general fund, uh, just over 21 million is for the public safety capital program to fund its fire apparatus replacements, 14 million for the communications capital program to replace uh, Silicon Valley regional communication system radios, and about 20 million, uh, 12 million for the Muni capital program to provide fundings uh, for repairs and maintenance to a number of uh, different facilities, including some of the cultural facilities. Third largest funding category is revenue from other agencies at about 684 million. Uh, the biggest uh, piece of the pie here that you see is from other agencies that use the water pollution control plant at almost 231 million. Uh, the next largest is from the state of California at about 179 million. But the traffic capital program is getting almost all of that funding at 173 million. Uh, they are anticipating getting about 135 million in state gas tax funding uh, for the pavement maintenance and uh, additional 22 million coming from the state's active transportation program for the better bikeways and other street improvement projects. In terms of uh, funding from other agencies at 142 million, about 125 million of it is coming from the valid transportation uh, for measure B related revenues. Uh, and that revenue is also uh, primarily earmarked for additional pavement maintenance work. And lastly, uh, the funding from the federal government at almost 133 million. Uh, it, 
uh, it's going to benefit several programs with the airport projecting to get about 86 million uh, in grants from the Transportation Security Administration, as well as Federal Aviation Administration. Traffic capital will get about 38 million, and the parks is uh, projected to get about 8.5 million. Okay, so taxes and fees and charges. Uh, this is an area of a funding source that was most impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And there was a lot of uncertainties initially uh, when the pandemic hit and the stay at home orders were issued. And which was also around the time when the proposed budget and the CIP were being built last year. So, but now that we've been dealing with this pandemic for more than a year, and then we have also seen how the local economy has been actually impacted in early months and how it's been recovering more recently. The projections that were, that were used to estimate these revenue sources have been revised mostly upwards based on uh, more recent data sets. And I'll, I have more information on the next slide, uh, which I'll share with you shortly. Uh, but just to go over the major funding sources within this category, the largest one is the construction and uh, conveyance tax at 184 million over five years. And this represents approximately 16% increase in five-year total of 158 million from the last year. And the real estate activity in the local area has been very resilient and, and, and that they remain strong uh, in the second half of the calendar year 2020 and also through the early parts of this year. Uh, next largest is the airport passenger facilities charge proceeds at almost 115 million. And this five-year projection is more than the double the amount that we had in last year's adopted CIP at 54 million. But of course, last time this year, we had a stay-at-home order and uh, any sort of the air travel was not really allowed. And we didn't know how long it was going to last. So the projection last year was very, very uh, conservative. But with the encouraging progress that the country has been making in recent months with the vaccines, uh, things are uh, expected to open up more and the air travel projections have been adjusted upwards. Uh, let's see, the next two uh, the major revenue sources, the building and structure construction tax and the construction excise tax uh, are um, both uh, uh, forecasted to remain fairly healthy in the region uh, for the next few years. Uh, and that this information was uh, based on the, the construction activity forecast as well as an analysis of actual tax collection patterns uh, provided by the uh, PBCE uh, department. Uh, this slide here provides a quick snapshot of how the revenue projections have changed over the last three uh, CIPs. Um, so in, in 2020 to 24 CIP, the overall projected revenue for these four major taxes and charges were uh, almost 515 million. And last year's CIP, these numbers were uh, uh, revised down significantly to uh, 369 million or a reduction of about 28%. And for the current uh, the proposed CIP, we uh, have uh, adjusted these numbers back up by about 112 million. Uh, but as you can see, the overall numbers are still going to be about 34 million lower than what we had at the pre-pandemic numbers uh, by about 34 million. The final major funding source category is a fund balance at just over 444 million. And uh, what you're seeing on this slide is just a short list of uh, uh, capital programs with the largest beginning fund balances. Uh, as mentioned previously, these numbers uh, typically tend to go up uh, from the proposed to the adopted as current year spending estimates get updated and more remaining uh, project budget uh, get uh, rebudgeted from the proposed to adopted. So this is one area of a funding source where we're going to see some num uh, this overall number go up uh, fairly uh, significantly. Okay, now to the other side of the equation uh, on how much is being planned to be spent on each capital program. Uh, as you can see on this table, the program is sorted from the largest to smallest based on the five-year dollar amount. And the top three that you see, water pollution control, traffic, and airport, uh, these are not really surprising given the number of large-scale projects uh, in those capital programs. 
Uh, public safety program continues to be on the top half of this list due to its measured T funding for various public safety projects. And parking, on the other hand, is lower on the list than usual because of severe reductions to the citywide parking revenue. Uh, and in fact, at 26.9 million uh, over five years, um, that you see uh, is 8.7 million of that is actually a transfer plan to be moved over to the operating fund to supplement the operating cost. Okay, uh, so at this point, I'll turn it over to Matt Kano uh, to go over the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Chris. Matt Kano, Director of Public Works. And um, even though I'm speaking to you today in this presentation, as you know, the delivery um, and development of our capital program is um, a multi-department um, uh, process with um, environmental services, airport, PRNS, DOT, finance budget, and many, many others playing tremendous roles. Um, um, and so this slide talks about the alignment with our general plan. This is something we present to the Planning Commission. It's very important that we look at not only uh, maintaining our infrastructure as part of the capital program, but also growing our infrastructure in alignment with the way that our city wants to grow in the future. And not only in the general plan, but there's also a number of, uh, number of specific plans per area, um, um, per department that talk about how, get into the more specifics about how they're going to maintain and grow our um, infrastructure. Next slide, please. Um, this is Measure T. We talk about Measure T um, to you a lot. And so, I, um, as you know, um, in 2018, it was passed and half of the $650 million or almost half is street repair. There's a number of public safety and other projects. And our next Measure T report to the Mayor and City Council is scheduled for next month. And so we'll get into more detail on the updates at that time. Next slide, please. We have um, slides for every capital program in here. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on each one. I'll just gloss through them pretty quickly. Sanitary sewer program, very, very important as we all know um, to keep the pipes underneath us um, that have our sanitary um, effluent flowing um, to the treatment plant um, in great shape. And so our team spends a lot of time analyzing, master planning and, um, and retrofitting um, coordinating with environmental services and Department of Transportation to make sure that our underground system maintain, is in great shape. Next slide, please. Storm sewer system. Um, this has a number of projects in it. Um, uh, measure, measure T project to help us with the storm um, um, ponding in the Charcot area, as well as repairing a lot of the outfalls that lead into our creeks. Um, next slide, please. Water pollution control, um, we could spend the whole presentation on this program, it, it, is, it is massive. Um, as Chris mentioned, it's a third of the use of funds um, here. Um, a number of very critical, very important projects um, are going on there that we talk about frequently at council and um, a big partnership there between environmental services um, and, and public works and many, many others to deliver that program. Next slide, please. Water utility system, um, as was mentioned previously, um, Today, um, this is um, the city operates, as you know, a water utility system to cover a portion of San Jose. Um, this fund managed by ESD makes sure that that system stays in good shape and grows as needed. Next slide, please. Library, um, this um, capital fund um, looks at not just the acquisition of materials, but also um, maintaining our current system. Of, we rebuilt many of our libraries in the early 2000s. Those libraries are starting to get a little older now. And so over time, we're gonna to continue to need to invest in keeping those up, up to shape. Next slide, please. Parks and community facilities. Um, these, program, these projects are very familiar to, to all of you. Um, there's a lot of great projects um, um, coming out of this program to um, enhance the lives of our residents. Um, um, and so um, I'm not gonna list them all, but um, this is to maintain, not, not just build new parks, but also to maintain our existing parks and infrastructure and community centers. Next slide, please. Public safety. Um, most of this, the bigger projects in here are Measure T, um, the police training center relocation, new fire stations, new emergency operations center and fire training center. There's also um, uh, funding here for fire apparatus replacement and, and other um, more um, regular items that are critically important. Next slide, please. Airport, a um, number of projects going on here, a, cup, a couple of big ones right now, that new, new garage at the airport and the new firefighting facility at the airport are under construction right now. Next slide, please. Parking, um, this is focused mostly on minor improvements to our parking garages in this upcoming capital budget. Next slide, please. Traffic, a number of projects here, not just um, to 
maintain our tra transportation infrastructure and all the pavement, but also, as you can see on the list, a number of traffic safety projects to enhance public safety um, coming out of this program. Next slide, please. Communications, um, very important um, that we are um, communication system and specifically the radios for the police, fire and other emergency um, and non-emergency responders in the city of San Jose are kept up to date. This program invests in those um, facilities to make sure that happens. Next slide, please. Sir, uh, service yard slide or municipal improvements, sorry. The municipal improvements, um, um, a number of um, buildings in San Jose and other um, facilities such as landfill at Singleton that uh, don't really fall into any other categories. Uh, um, uh, this fund uh, covers that. Thank you, next slide, please. Service yards, um, the city has a number of service yards, um, the central service yard across the street from Kelly Park where we're building a new fire training center, the Maybury service yard where our transportation department's uh, maintenance hub is. And it's very important for us to keep those infrastructure up, that infrastructure up to date so that we can um, serve our public um, adequately. Next slide, please. Developer assisted. Um, this is focused mostly on undergrounding projects. Um, we are coming to council soon with a more detailed report on our undergrounding program. Um, um, but this uses developer fees to um, underground PG&E um, lines throughout the city. Next slide, please. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. We, as I mentioned before, um, this capital program delivery is uh, every department in the city is is involved, um, some more than others, and we have representatives from many of those departments here to help answer any detailed questions you may have. And that ends our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Chris. All right, let's uh, go first to the public for any questions about our capital program and capital budget uh, or comments. Mr. Beekman. Hi, good morning. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, to try to continue my words from uh, last Thursday morning, about an hour into your session last Thursday morning, it was asked by the mayor to David Sykes and also mentioned by Angel Rios and Councilperson Perales, what are we going to be doing in the next few years? We're not uh, fully sure of our direction and purpose. And I've described, you know, in my own way that I feel that we possibly need to be preparing for an upcoming uh, natural, major natural disaster event like a large earthquake by say the year 2023 uh, in the Bay Area. I will give uh, statistics why I feel that way more in the next week or two to describe my feelings. But, you know, not to cause worry, and, I, and it is a guesswork, you know, it is my feeling by 2023, we may possibly have a large earthquake in San Jose. It is from that, that we have to prepare. And how do we do that? And I've been asking, it is if, with our good practices, our best practices now, that we can address such a situation by 2023 and come out of it in much better shape. And then, and then after the year 2023, really start going on the move to our better selves, our better practices. But in the meantime, we have to really bear down and we have to consider renewable energy ideas first. We have to consider the ideas of open public policy practices first. Those are the practices that are gonna more easily get us out of the, a natural disaster event. And uh, I, we just have to be prepared in, with our best selves, with our best practices. And that's what I'm gonna be really pushing for. And um, I have a lot more to say about this stuff. Um, thank you for your patience and me trying to explain myself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Mayhan. Thanks, Mayor. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the presentation, really helpful to get that overview and see where, where we're making investments. I, I was curious if we are quantifying, I'm sure we are, I've, I've heard quite a bit about our um, deferred maintenance backlog in certain areas, but didn't see that captured in the summary. I, I think it might be a helpful perspective for the council to understand where we are um, overall. It's good to see where we're making investments, but, but what is the extent of deferred maintenance? Um, and, and have we quantified that? And are we able to kind of show uh, where we have the biggest gaps essentially. Is, is that part of the conversation? Thank you, Councilmember, for the question, Matt Kano again in Public Works. Um, yes, that's absolutely uh, 
extremely important. And we um, we last report we report annually to the Transportation Environment Committee. Um, and our last report was in March of this year, and we reported a $1.7 billion one-time infrastructure backlog, as well as ongoing needs of, um, yeah, as well as ongoing needs. And so that is right now increasing on an annual basis. It was helped a lot by Measure T. Measure T really slowed it down um, from increasing, um, especially in the pavement area, but it is um, a large number that we continue to focus on. Thanks, Matt. And you, you actually got to the point I was trying to make and did not articulate well, which is whether or not it's growing or shrinking. So did you have a sense of how much it's growing by current under the current um, budget and, and where the growth is greatest? Yes, um, I'm looking right now at our chart. So it's, it's growing by about 92, um, 92 million a year. Okay. Um, and the greatest growth area right now is in the um, annual unfunded needs is in the parks, pools, and open space area um, at 35, um, 35 million per year. Okay, thanks. That's helpful context. And, and I assume, um, I mean, I think Chris had kind of made the point about needing to identify revenue in, in, in at least one of these areas. I, I assume as we look out on the horizon and kind of think of the overall uh, you know, capital balance sheet, if you will, um, is identifying sources of revenue our, our best strategy at this point, or is there anything else we can do to uh, not incur such a large increase in the, in the deferred maintenance costs each year? It's a pretty substantial number. Sure, it's, it's a little bit of everything. Um, I know that, um one of the things, and Nicole Burnham can address this in the parks area, is really looking at how we program our funds in each area and make sure we're focused on the appropriate balance between the new nice things to have versus the absolute, um, we gotta fix this type stuff. And I know Nicole's been doing a lot of work in PRNS she can talk to, but even with all that, there are definitely new revenue sources um, hopefully we can look at in the future because we're not gonna cover these gaps with just change in funding. So Nicole, you wanna add to that? Yeah, and I would just add in, yeah, I think I agree with everything Matt said. And, um, you know, we do work pretty hard to try to balance, you know, stewardship of existing assets with with future programming. Um, I think one of the one of the fundamental challenges we see is just our ongoing lack of staffing on the operating side is still a challenge for us. Right. And I think we think we, we believe, you know, we could manage the infrastructure backlog growth more effectively if operating staff had enough capacity to really be able to, to dig deep and, and manage, you know, more effectively some of the maintenance, but we're so understaffed that it's hard for them to keep pace with it. So it ends up in a, in a capital backlog when it doesn't always need to. That's really interesting. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful perspective to add. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. That, that was all I had for now, Mayor. Council member, if I could just point you, uh, so that for reference, the um, infrastructure backlog memo is attached as an appendix to the proposed capital budget. So um, it's easy uh, reference there for folks who are interested in reading more about it. Great. I will dive into it. Thanks, Jim. It is easy, but a depressing read. Yes. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I had, oh, Council member Pross? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just following up on what I was uh, asking about last week, um, and thank you to uh, Lily Lamb for sending me the, uh, I think the, the documents or the pages that I should be referring to. It was still a little confusing though. This is in regards to the uh, pedestrian improvements, uh, safety budget uh, item or line item that uh, each council district is able to tap into uh, every single year. And the document is uh, on pages V, 624 and B659 is what Lily had sent me. Um, but it still wasn't clear, I guess, how we get to the $200,000 per council district. Lily had mentioned that the B659 is where that would be under. And I do see the safety pedestrian improvements there, um, but it's, it's certainly not clear uh, that we're looking at the, the, two, um, the $200,000 per council district in that. And so I'm just kind of curious um, where exactly, you know, I should be pulling that data from. And so maybe somebody from DOT can speak to that. And then I wanted to see, what, you know, how long it's been essentially at that dollar amount and how is that something that we can 
increase over time uh, as that dollar amount has, has remained the same since I've been in office. And I don't know how, you know, mayor can speak to the fact that maybe it's been that long for a while and um, certainly it becomes less and less useful as some of these uh, traffic improvements um, become more costly over the years. And so $200,000 does not really go that far. Um, so I just want to see if somebody could speak to that. Council member, thank you, uh, John Rista, Director of Transportation. Uh, look, maybe you start with the the uh, how long it's been like that. I'm probably going to need some help with uh, some of my staff that's been around longer than I have, but um, it's it's been that that amount and that uh, description for quite a while. So I don't know if Jim or maybe uh, Lily or Laura would know the answer how long it's been like that, but. Then in terms of uh, where you find it, uh, it is on those pages. It's also in the uh, source and use uh, document as well, where we're, we're calling out those funds. 1,200,000 uh, for each one of the, uh, so it uh, translates to roughly about 200,000 per district. It's not a hard number, because that can fluctuate every year, depending on the type of projects and the number of projects in each one of the districts. But um, someone can answer possibly the how long it's been that level. I, I don't know that right off the top of my head. John, this is Lily, uh, Deputy Director to Traffic Operations and Safety. Uh, it, well, I would say it's been at least seven years, uh, going on seven years. And the, as you said, John, it's not hard, fast rule of 200, but it's an average of $200,000 per council district, given that the uh, budget is about $2 million. The additional $251 or $261 was uh, for the uh, position of Vision Zero Manager. So you'll see $2.2 .2 million in that appropriation. Okay, that is, that is um, helpful. And is, are these two documents, is, is sort of one separate from the other or is one sort of explaining the other? I'm trying to look at this on page v624 and then the other page that you would give me was uh 659 right 624 the 1.7 million dollars is one time funds that uh, the mayor uh, allocated last fiscal year for uh data driven processed uh, uh safety projects in which uh lamb and her team are um conducting a citywide collision review and it will produce the top 10 or 20 20 locations of which we will uh, implement the safety projects that is a one-time money okay thank you um <laughs> by the way sorry uh, that that list will go to the vision zero task force for the upcoming meeting for the 1.7 million dollar expenditure okay thank you and so and and thank you for the history too as far as potentially this being seven years that this has been that way I want to see what the opportunity is uh, for us to be able to. Sorry, my, my son is a little eager at the moment. It just happened to happen at this time. Um, I wanted to see what the opportunity is to increase that dollar amount, um, maybe even on sort of like a schedule, uh, because it, it I, if it has been seven years, that would make sense as to why that's that's all I've known. Councilmember John Risto again. Uh, the source of those funds is our construction taxes uh, from two different sources. So it's just a matter of a priority. Um, that is a, a limited funding source where we get a forecast every year and then on for five years. And we try to balance the needs of the department and the system using those construction taxes. Some are restricted to um, higher order streets, meaning um, uh, arterials and collectors and the other funds are, are usable anywhere. So it's just a matter of what we try to do. It's just been that amount. So we have been plugging that in. So there's no reason it couldn't go up if a priority and direction is to move that up. It just comes with then a reduction in something else that's already in the balanced budget. And, and John, and if I could, maybe, if I may just chime in too. I think there's probably also, um, you know, it's something that, that definitely, you know, that can be looked at. I think there's just from a, a, a capacity, I think, John, your team probably there's, you know, there's the, the funding dollars just for the, the project, but then I, I know making sure that there's the staff capacity to, to churn the projects out is probably 
um, we have to look at that one too to make sure that we you know any expectations were were being met, even if we did in, increase the dollar amount. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, these these represent lots of very small projects, so we've got teams that are um, assigned to each one of the different districts that work on that. So it is a capacity as well. If you if you want to up it, then we we would just need to. They, it would just translate into lots more small projects that we would just need to be able to deliver on. Is there a separate dollar amount in the operating budget that ties into this two hundred thousand dollars, or is this just sort of absorbed and absorbed into the staff time that that is already allocated? I think the staff time is already budgeted in the CIP. Yeah. These are these are CIP related uh, staffing. Yeah, the, the, these funds are just for the capital portion of those projects. So. so is there a separate place I should be looking at dollar amounts that are tied into this to the staff time or is that just coming out of the $200,000 as well? Councilmember Perales, uh, there's not a separate general funds for these pedestrian safety enhancement program. There is a different set of funding for day-to-day uh, -day operations when we get calls for uh, reviewing intersection visibility, uh, cur uh, parking restriction or parking ma uh, curb management, um, stop sign studies. We we have general funding for that type of work, but not for CIP projects. And I want to make sure that, and maybe Jim can further explain that the the, the funding is likely coming from the state gas tax that we receive. That then goes to the general fund, and then we get that. Is that correct, Jim? Our I don't. I, don't goes I, I wasn't talking about that that level of source. I yeah. was, I was meaning, uh, you pointed mm -hmm. out, John, that if we were to increase this two hundred thousand dollars significantly enough, that then it would have an impact on staff time. So I was curious, where where currently, based on just the two hundred thousand dollars, where does that staff time come from? Where does the funding for that staff time come from today? Uh, in general fund. But I just wanted to clarify what where that. Uh, okay, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean like where like it's total source. I, I mean our in our our local source sort of. A, and and I was curious, is there you know is there something then in correlation that if we were to increase this two hundred thousand um, dollars per council district, is there another fund for the staff time that we should be you know increasing as well? And that that's mm -hmm. that's what I was trying to get to there. Mm -hmm. We do have a general fund appropriation as well as a mix of uh, uh, construction excise funds uh, that fund general projects, general activities, and general engineering um, work. And those same staff are used to, for designing the projects, maybe not the delivery portion, but as part of the engineering work, the staff who's uh, most familiar with the district uh, are asked to work on the holistic uh, evaluation and then recommendations and and through design and then we hand it off to the uh, the construction management team which is on the CIP side. Okay, so that that makes sense and um, obviously you know we wouldn't maybe get down to that detail at the council level if we were to give a direction to say that we wanted to see this dollar amount uh, increased then uh, you know obviously Jim your team you'd be looking at what dollars would be needed for the staff time if, if it did get that high and, and that's something you could bring back. So I, my yeah, interest really is, go ahead, Jim. Councilman, I think if I could, if I could offer, I think, you know, there's probably enough co co complexity here. And if, if there's direction the council wants to make, I think we'll probably issue a manager's budget addendum just to kind of spell out the different variables there. Um, just so it's clear that I know there's, we have a lot of data there in the traffic CIP. So we'll, we'll um, work with DOT to, Put out an MBA to kind of spell out, you know, what that might mean. Thank you. And you know, I honestly, I, I'm not even necessarily poking to see if you could do an MBA this year. I, I, I you know, recognizing, uh, I was just trying to get some better understanding of it, recognizing where we're at in the, in the budget. This is not necessarily something I, I'm eager to change this year. Well, some of my colleagues may be, and that's fine. If you wanted to, to go through with that MBA. Um, I would be looking moving forward. So kind of gearing up for next year and, and how do we prep a budget that actually does show this dollar amount increase. Again, really at the, at the base purpose of that would be because some of these uh, actual traffic calming uh, improvements, they actually begin to cost more right over time. And so if, if we're not 
upping this dollar amount, then we're, we're you know, lowering the amount of projects we can actually do. And so that's the, the, the number one reason. But the, the other reason is I actually think each council district could benefit from having you know, significantly more dollars in this area to be able to look at projects. And if we were to increase that dollar amount, my interest would be that we do so, we disperse it equitably. And so we actually look at what areas of the city, for instance, the, um, you know, who has higher KSIs, right? And where, where are we seeing some of this need uh, similar to what we're doing with Vision Zero? And so rather than just all, you know, and even split across the board at $200,000, it would be where do we see the highest need? And so that, it's just a little more complex on what it is that I would be looking for. And um, I think, you know, last year uh, I, I had asked for, you know, s some some money, extra money in the budget, $100,000. I believe Councilor Davis asked for $200,000. I, I may just address it that same way this year. And obviously each individual council member can do the same. But rather than, than do that, I, I think that there should be a mechanism that increases this uh, a little bit uh, year over year potentially. Uh, and even if it does so more significantly, that it does it in a way that it's, it's more equitable and addresses the, the different needs throughout the, the city. So I, I'm not asking for that MBA this year. Thank you for the, the, the you know, further explanation. Uh, this will be something that, that I personally will, may want to dive into more next year. Thanks. That's it for me, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, other questions? I, I had a couple just to follow up on uh, Council Member Paralysis questioning uh, on that line. I, uh, John, that that two hundred thousand dollar allocation really is for the very local, uh, you know, hyper local neighborhood based uh, traffic calming. Is that right, Mayor no. John Risto? Again, yes, that's yeah. correct. It's sort of small pedestrian safety in yeah. and around neighborhoods, schools, those kind of things. And I appreciate that you know the majority of our dollars are really focused where the data is driving us to where we know the serious injuries and deaths are happening on our roadways, and that tends to be the priority corridors uh, where we're focused and we'd all like to have more money on all these things, but just to focus on that, the $200,000. John, before you came aboard the city, I think you were still with VTA at the time, but I know Laura probably still has memory of all this. Um, the, the city came out with a toolkit for neighborhoods or a toolbox of different uh, traffic calming options. And I remember we had a lot of really extensive debate over humps and bumps and lumps, <laughs> sure, different ways to, to slow a car down and a road. And uh, I remember at the time, Willie McDonald was the fire chief, it was like three chiefs ago, uh, because we had this big issue over, you know, can fire trucks get over, speed them up? How do we do this? And I thought we all came to this great compromise where we have a, a broader um, a speed bump with slots in it to accommodate a broader axle base that fire would be okay with. And then we'd go off marching and we'd have either lumps or humps. I don't know what we call these things. And we could, we could allocate these at really low cost, like eight or $10,000 per hump. And we could do it without extensive studies and without a lot of staff and all that kind of stuff. We could just get it out there and address what we know are significant quality of life issues and, and safety issues for a lot of neighborhoods that are very frustrated with, with high-speed traffic. So I assumed after we had that kumbaya moment and fire blessed it, then we would see a proliferation of humps and bumps all throughout our neighborhoods where we see a lot of complaints of high-speed traffic. And I guess my question is, why not? So Mayor John Risto again, and humps, bumps, and lumps are in our toolbox. And yeah. we are actually, we consider those uh, in any neighborhood or any roadway that makes, first we have to, determined that it makes some engineering sense to do that and it's practical and safe. And those, um, those types of traffic slowing devices are actually supported by Chief Sapien and his team. We're, pl we're properly placed and, and uh, when we go through a really good process to determine that. We're actually looking at a couple of uh, humps along areas in, in um, um, both District 6 along some of the neighborhoods there as well as District 3 that the neighbors actually want these. We go through a process to actually survey neighbors and property owners that are on fronting on these and make sure that they are supported by the community through a survey. So we're, they are fully in our toolbox and we apply them in the right appropriate way that of course, we're not gonna put necessarily put these on major arterials, but right, right, right. many streets qualify for that in terms of what, what types of 
bomb tomps or other type of slowing devices that would make sense in neighborhoods. So they're all in the toolbox um, and we're applying them where it makes sense and where the community wants that and the property owners fronting those actually vote for them. So they're in, they're in. Okay, well maybe this is more, more an offline conversation. I'm just curious as to why we haven't seen them proliferating given the demand that seems to be chronic in certainly in the neighborhoods when I was a council member that's, you know, that was the top complaint and um, happy to talk more offline. Yeah, uh, we'd be more than happy to. And, and there's a number of different things that we do depending on situation, but all of those, uh, all of those ideas and, and uh, features that are out there, whether it be a traffic signal, a traffic circle or roundabout or curb bulb outs or lumps and bumps and that sort of thing signage and all those things are all in the toolbox and we apply them probably it could be a funding issue that you know as the council member prowls was leading towards we're able to do some of the additional work in in uh, north side area because uh, mayor's budget message put funding an additional amount of funding into the neighborhood up there so you will see some coming in that neighborhood and hopefully some other ones around the city as well okay all right thanks john um Question about Columbus Park uh, and the soccer uh, fields that were deploying there. Nicole, I know we had big visions for an amazing soccer complex in the Guadalupe uh, that seemed to be defeated by, I think it was Caltrans as a relevant agency. Is that right? And their regulations relating to what could occur or not occur in the airport approach area. How are we able to get past that with Columbus? Is it just because it happened to be a park before? Yes, that, that is correct. Nicole Burnham, PRNS. Yes, it is chartered park land, was an existing park not purchased with FAA money. Also, the density of what we're doing there, we're looking at two, maybe three fields rather than the seven or eight that we were looking at um, uh, for the full complex. So that you know, the density of people that we're putting in the putting in that area is different as well, which also helps our, our okay. conversation. Magic of grandfathering. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. I think that'll, that'll be a great project, particularly as um, I know we've got a lot of improvements coming in Guadalupe, so that's going to be fantastic. Um, a general question, Matt, as we look at, and this may be for Jim, um, there seems to be a very significant transfer of general fund money for capital projects this year, $49.5 Do you have any sense of what's What's drawn most of that general fund money or sense of the breakdown? I'm sure it's deep in this budget that I have not fully reviewed yet, but I, I can just tell from the transmittal document that it seems a bit more than we've seen in the past. Yep, Mayor, so I'll check right now and the team can jump on, but I think a lot of that is the fire training center. So we had that money from the sale proceeds that was budgeted in the general fund. I see. And so, you know, what in, it's not sort of uh, pure general money because it came from a specific source, but it's that's where the money is received and spent out of. So I think that's the biggest component. Okay. That's not our traditional. I got it. So it just yeah. came from that transaction. Great. Makes a lot of sense. Um, as you look at the the document, uh, page five and six of the transmittal uh, document, the, the base memo, um, a couple of questions about how um, the allocation of the CIP within Measure T program. First, the public safety reserves is about 18, almost $19 million in reserves. We're spending about half of that this year, it looks like, and the other half in 23, 24. Where are those reserves going? Which projects do we know? Sure, um, Mayor, thank you for your question. Um, I'll answer that in a more gen general way right now and see if I can follow up on the specifics. Um, in a general way, um, to establish the Measure T reserves, what we did is we took some of the projects that we were planning on doing, such as the Police Administrative Building Rehab, the 311, uh, 911 Center, and some of the Fire Station Rehab, um, and we put those all in the reserves initially because we didn't have specific scopes for them. We also took a portion of each of the fire stations, original budget, put that in the reserves for the new fire stations. Um, and so that's how we established our reserves at the beginning um, to make sure we had some flexibility organizationally. And so um, I apologize, I don't have the specific answer to your, to the, I don't have the exact answer to that question, so I'll have to follow up. That's um, fine, I, I can uh, pour into it and, and sort it out a little bit. I was just curious. Um, and then also with the LED streetlight conversions, 
I was under the impression that we were going to be able to complete most of that by the end of this year, but it looks like we've got a lot funded in the out years in 22-23 and then in 23-24, uh, almost, almost $9 million between those two years. Yes, yes, Mayor. So um, we uh, we do, and I'll have to check on the exact schedule, but it's roughly the end of the year. Um, we're planning on com um, completing the conversion of all the street lights to LED. But and additionally, as part of that project, we also have a, a budget for smart controllers. Um, so we're going to need to go back um, and put smart controllers on a certain number of the street lights. We're not going to be able to afford them all. And then there's also a portion of the LED budget that is for city facilities, um, which we have been working on, but are not going to finish that by the end of this year. But um, so there are, again, the smart controllers uh, portion of the streetlights and then the facilities portions of the LED conversion will not be done by the end of this calendar year. But the plan is to have the streetlights all converted by the end of this calendar year or pretty quick, very quickly thereafter. That's great. Thank you, Matt. I think that'll make a big difference in a lot of neighborhoods. Um, <clears throat> And then on the, the last question I had, the Measure T projects, uh, the community centers and emergency shelters portion, um, a little more than 10 million is allocated between next year and the following year, in the CIP. Um, since these are really, the focus is sort of hardening them as emergency locations, are these gonna be opportunities where we're gonna be able to deploy microgrids? We are taking a look at that. We are um, we are um, planning on June fifteenth coming to council with our next measure T annual or twice annual memo, and we're gonna have we have a, a pretty long section on community centers in there about how we've scoped out hardening these community centers with PRNS, obviously, um, and we we will look for the opportunity to. Um, my team that's working on microgrids is the same team. It's the exact same team that is managing these projects with, with Nicole for the hardening of the community centers. And so we will look for opportunities to do microgrids as we do this hardening. Um, I, we don't know yet what, right now we don't have any, the measure T budget is, as you'll see in the June memo, um, is almost really not enough to cover the minimum of what we need to do to harden the 10 major HUD community centers. So if we do right. microgrids, we may have to come up with additional funding from somewhere else, but we will look at that opportunity as we move yeah. these projects forward. Okay. Well, thanks, Matt. I just think in terms of resilience, you know, I believe it's certainly worth the expenditure of extra CNC money or the funds. I mean, I know we're short on parts capital, but, you know, I'd be happy to push for other sources as well. Um, to get some resilience and, and I'm agnostic as to what technology we use. I just, you know, I just don't want a bunch of diesel generators. <laughs> we, you know, if those supply lines break down in an earthquake, we're stuck with everybody else. And it sure would be nice if we had, you know, solar and batteries and, and you know, the kinds of things that we know are gonna be critical for us and um, to help, help folks get through whatever our next disaster might be. So anyway, I, I certainly support being aggressive and would support, you know, looking at measures in the following year, whatever it might be. I think we're all awakening to the reality of fire, wildfires and natural disasters are posing to us and um, floods, everything else. And, and let's face it, it's not gonna get any easier with climate change. So I think our residents will be receptive as well to the notion that we need to invest in resilience to, to protect our safety. Uh, so anyway, thank you for that. Um, and then, uh, you know, an ongoing challenge we've had is around the storm sewer system financing. I know we've been stuck because of state law around um, our inability to update that fee to actually keep track with the capital needs. And I guess I had a question about whether there is any opportunity for a legislative fix here, or is this something we're stuck with because it requires a, a vote of the California electorate or, you know, what is our path? <laughs> Hi, Carrie. <laughs> Hi, Council Member. Um, Carrie Romano, Director of Environmental Services. Um, you know, over the last many years, we've um, evaluated different options. Several years ago, there was some legislative um, activity, and we thought that that would be um, 
that would be a path that would make a lot of sense for us. Um, unfortunately, it didn't turn out um, as uh, as to fulfill everything that we had hoped for. Um, so we're still looking, uh, but in summary, there's really not a solution today. But um, but I think the team is uh, is looking at what our long term solutions would be. Some could be legislative, and then um, and then others could be uh, different ballot initiatives or um, or looking more deeply at um, the type of work and making sure that we've exhausted all the options to fund that type of work. And so lots of work ahead, but uh, but we recognize it needs to be uh, it needs to be taken on. I know the water district just went out with a flood control measure last year. Did they talk to us at all about, hey, could we wrap up a whole series of projects for, well, I understand it's not just flood control for storm sewer, but I, I But it could be, some of it could be. And that's what we mean by really looking in and maybe yeah. decoupling and rethinking how we've categorized things. Um, make sure we're taking advantage of everything. We have done that in the past. Um, and um, and that has helped out, but um, but you're right. There is a significant capital need, and um, and we do need to figure it out. Thanks, Carrie. Appreciate it. Look forward to talking more offline on that. All right, great. Uh, any other questions, Mayor? Or, Mayor, if yeah. I could correct my earlier statement, you had a question there about the general fund contributions to the CIP, and I, I yeah. misspoke there. The same. Thanks for, for Chris for correcting me. The uh, the fire training center. That's more of a current year ex expense. That forty nine point five million. That's over the the five years of the CIP program. So oh. on on Roman numeral um, three seven, kind of uh, um, where we kind of summarize all of the revenues in the capital program, which also includes the general fund contributions to the capital program, has them all listed out there. So public safety is twenty one point one million, primarily consists of the fire apparatus re re replacement of eighteen point eight eight million. Um, we've got communications for 14.1. We do have a big infusion of about 5.25 million in 2022 for radio re re replacement. We talked about that a little bit in the general fund. Um, and then we have some ongoing for muni uh, in, in, uh, improvements. So um, it, it's uh, that is over a five year period, not just for 21, 20. I got it. Yeah. So I misunderstood. Thank you, Jim. I, I assumed it was like just one year. Thank you, Jim. All right. Uh, we have one member of the public who just raised their hand. Daniel Torres, did you want to speak on this capital budget issue? Good morning, honorable mayor and the council members. My name is Daniel Torres and I am a member of the, uh, excuse me, one second, sorry. I'm a member of the Silicon Valley um, Essential Worker Council. Throughout the pandemic, the essential workers have been risking our lives and those of our families to provide the critical work that we do in keeping the economy running. As Essential Worker Council, we've identified a set of recommendations to guide the city's budget decisions. One, to strengthen community services like child and elder care, parks and libraries, health care, and public health, and reliable internet and make sure that people Daniel, provide these think, services. Daniel, I think you want to speak on the next item. Oh, We're actually just on the capital budget right now. All right. Cool. Thanks, Daniel. All right. Uh, I think that's it then for questions and comments on the capital budget. So should we move on now to the American Rescue Plan and other related expenditures? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, so we'll we'll jump now into the uh, presentation on uh, community and economic recovery. So we do have a, a presentation that uh, I think will cover a lot of ground and, and hopefully get us to a place where we're um, working from the same set of information, recognizing that uh, we don't have all the answers here. But uh, I think what's important today is, is laying out the strategy for moving forward, and and of course how we're integrating equity into our decision making and making sure that we're taking advantage of all the funding sources um, in, a, in a strategic manner. So I'm gonna pass it off to, uh, to Kip and Lee and the team, uh, and Jim Shannon and others uh, to walk us through the presentation. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Lee Wilcox, Deputy City Manager. Um, and I'll be kicking us off. And uh, as you can see from the yeah, list, an awful guys. lot of folks here presenting with us today. And before we get started, I do want to advance the slides um, or have uh, Sarah advance the slides to both our Spanish and Vietnamese interpretation instructions. And then we'll start from there. 
Hola y bienvenidos a esta reunión. Para acceder a la función de interpretación, haga clic en el icono del globo en la parte inferior de la ventana de Zoom y selecciona el idioma que desea. Para escuchar claramente el audio de interpretación, le recomendamos que también seleccione la opción para silenciar el audio original, que es la opción más baja en el menú después de hacer clic en el icono del globo. Xin chào và cảm ơn quý vị đã tham dự buổi họp ngày hôm nay. Để truy cập vào phần thông dịch của ứng dụng Zoom, xin nhấn vào biểu tượng hình quả địa cầu ở phía dưới của màn hình và chọn ngôn ngữ theo ý muốn của quý vị. Để nghe rõ lời phiên dịch, chúng tôi khuyến khích quý vị chọn chức năng tắt âm thanh góc nằm ở phía cuối trong phần tùy chọn của biểu tượng quả địa cầu. Thank you. Um, so today uh, we'll get started and our session will focus on um, how we resource our community and economic recovery together. We will start with what we know uh, and as Dave just outlined what we don't know um, about the federal and the state funding bills that have come forward and how the city has integrated equity into our budget analysis and future budget recommendations. Lastly, we will also start to outline how we've prioritized the council approved COVID-19 response and recovery roadmap and how we believe that taking uh, an incremental approach for our recommendations and decision-making on uh, allocating these funds is the best approach. Next slide. At the end of our discussion and the last time we were together, or sorry, at the end of this discussion and our time together, we want to accomplish three important things. And one is a common understanding of the sources that can support our recovery work, um, not only the amounts that are coming forward, um, but also the restrictions and what we know that is coming in for our partners. Second, how we are approaching equity, or more specifically, the area, the area between the high-level approach that you heard last week during the budget study sessions and the place-based approach um, that you heard two weeks ago in the recovery study session. And then lastly, any of the unknowns that lie ahead and what we do know of when we will have that information. Next slide. At the May 4th study session, um, you were presented with this slide, which demonstrates our newest enterprise priority, the COVID-19 pandemic community and economic recovery, which highlights 18 different initiatives that guide our transition from response to recovery, with those efforts highlighted in the pink, as well as the purple initiatives that represent our other critical enterprise priorities in the coming year. Today's session will focus solely on these pink boxes. Next slide. You saw this statement two weeks ago at the um, Community and Economic Recovery st Study session, and I wanted to start with it again to emphasize it's important to our work. As we move into recovery, we are grounding our efforts in the understanding that so many in our community have and continue to experience pain and trauma. Our biggest challenge and opportunity is to foster an equitable recovery to a better new normal. And to do so successfully, it must be done in partnership with the whole community for the benefit of those most burdened by the crisis. As we've mentioned before, our response to COVID-19 was doing, our recovery is going to be doing with. Next slide. Similarly, our organizations, organizational recovery efforts are grounded in these values in front of you. As Rosalind Huey so eloquently described in our last study session, we are focused on leading with people. We are focused on equity and closing the widening gaps that will lead us to a sustained future for all. We honor the priceless value of everyone and we want to improve the lives and the most vulnerable and in need to lift our entire community. We are choosing to view each other as neighbors and will extend empathy to understand each person's situation and their perspective, all of which will lead us to action and we will work to provide the resources and tools to help people thrive. Next slide, please. The last study session, we learned um, about the incredible work that our departments have been leading um, and their plans to transition from response to recovery. Today, we are going to focus on how we resource that work. After a year of fighting for fiscal relief um, amongst our own budget shortfalls, federal austerity during the previous administration, and 
current recovery package, the current recovery repack, uh, package delivers significant and flexible state and local um, flexibility to state and local governments. The funding level is huge, um, yet small in comparison to the historical inequities that must be resolved and the suffering experienced and currently being experienced by San Jose families as a result of the economic devastation caused by COVID-19. The good news is that our region will receive vastly more funding than just the city funding. Yet to date, we do not understand all of these levels, the restrictions that come with them, and how our partners want to prioritize their, the community's needs and their funding strategies. However, we are committed to working with these partners and will continue to do so over the coming weeks and months. It will take time to recover to a better normal in coordination with our partners and particularly uh, uh, with the community around planning and engaging many more. The opportunity to do something uh, transformational does require a collective impact, impact approach. And we are committed to working with the County of Santa Clara, our school districts and all of the other partners. For this reason, like many other cities throughout the state and throughout the country right now, as well as um, as Dave outlined last week, the County of Santa Clara, we are recommending that the city take a slightly different approach to allocating all these dollars with allocating enough today uh, to help keep our response focused, as well as start planning and making initial incremental progress around some of the recovery efforts while coming back to the mayor and council in August and September with more regular updates um, and, and future budget allocations throughout the fiscal year as needed. We've arrived at this conclusion for several reasons. Uh, first and foremost, engaging our community around further needs and outcomes and priorities. Um, second, many of the unknowns that we're going to go through um, today, as well as our own funding, not just the money, but also the rules coming out. Um, our partners in the community, as well as the uh, city of Santa Clara um, and what their funding is going to look like. Um, the support from the federal and state government that our own residents will see, receive directly. These variables are all important as the needs of our community will surely outweigh the available funding. So ensuring that our region can maximize every single dollar uh, coming into this is important. Um, and then lastly, um, as illustrated by the president, um, as well as congressional leaders, um, this is the last federal funding package of this size with this type of flexibility for the foreseeable future and the funding will need to last for several years. Next slide. We've presented this um, to you before and from a financial perspective, uh, our response to transition will be guided by these three principles. Do the recovery right, maximize reimbursement, um, and other federal funding sources or state funding sources and minimize the general fund impact. In doing so, to do the recovery right, we will be focused on our most vulnerable and at-risk populations through compassionate action, making tough decisions quickly and working as a single team with our community so everyone gets through this together. To do this, we need to maximize other funding sources as well as reimburse, uh, reimbursement. Much of the recovery can be covered by state and federal funding, including some FEMA reimbursement, which we'll outline, as well as the American Rescue Act. We will maximize our reimbursement potential, strategically matching the highest and best funding source to the highest and best eligible uses that our community deems important, and strengthening our funding requests through clear documented processes, which is important to protect and minimize any impact to our general fund. While the economic crisis affects all of our funds. The most powerful effect that our community needs is the essential services that we've been, be, been able to provide every day. Therefore, minimizing any impact to the general fund and essential services will be important um, over this time period. As we work together to recover from COVID-19, we will use non-general uh, fund sources um, and other grant um, restricted funds where possible to mitigate this um, to mitigate impacts to our general fund. It is important uh, to realize that these three principles are intentionally stacked in priority order. Our first principle is and must always be to do the right thing, even when that action is not reimbursable or there could potentially be a general fund impact. However, that, that, that does not give us a license to spend freely without deliberate uh, uh, forethought and purpose around these recommendations as we have an obligation to our taxpayers as well as the federal state grantors 
and most importantly, our community to figure out how we do this within our means. Next slide. And this is a slide that we'll come back to um, several times as a, as a jumping off point for different sections of this presentation. Um, the three principles we are going to be applying throughout um, our financial recovery with the many funding sources that we'll go through today. Some of our recovery programs are already underway and funded through uh, funding sources uh, coming from federal and state government. And we've outlined these in several budgetary actions um, that have come forward uh, thus far. But today's presentation will focus on some of the newer sources, um, such as the American Rescue Plan and some of what was released uh, last Friday um, by the state of California. These funding sources will help drive our uh, financial recovery for the years to come. Next slide. Before I jump, uh, before we start to jump into some of the details, and I, I've, I've highlighted this a few times, I do really want to emphasize the current dynamic um, and the environment that we are in. Um, with the American Rescue Plan, uh, we received guidance a week ago, and um, that is actually interim guidance as we work through with many other cities um, and the U.S. Treasury Department to better understand that and get more specificity. Um, however, um, compared to uh, other funding packages, it does seem very flexible. Um, so while our financial picture is getting clearer and some variables are known, there is still a lot of ambiguity and a lot of challenges uh, changing from day to day. Uh, in addition to the federal landscape uh, that continues to, to change and evolve, the states evolves quite a bit. And with such a large sur surplus, a lot of funds are on the table for our community to make sure that we do recovery right. Um, and the, the governor's uh, May revise uh, came out four days ago, so we're still analyzing that. You know, beyond our own internal team, this work of figuring out what ma what sources matches to what best use includes a lot of important partners, including our own fiscal recovery experts, Whit O'Brien and Ernst and Young, our congressional delegation, our federal and state leg legislative advocacy firms, and other partners in the region, such as the County of Santa Clara, our partnership with Bloomberg and Harvard Leadership Initiative, and the network of another hundred uh, cities through that initiative all working together to analyze the guidelines, best share best practices, and any communication from the US Treasury Department or state of California, and then jointly advocate together where needed. Next slide. For the city of San Jose, our funding sources supporting the recovery efforts are coming from a variety of sources, some directly from the federal government, like the American Rescue Act, but others come from the federal government to the state and then through specified formulas such as block grants. And there are other funding sources through competitive grant processes that are being developed now. More importantly, if I were to say that this slide could be animated, I'd really wanna to convey to you that while we know some of the buckets and the numbers, such as the, the things that are highlighted in green here, um, what's available for reimbursement and the, and the gray buckets, um, there's not specificity. So it's impossible for us in a, as an administration today to paint the, uh, a full picture for the council as part of your deliberation and decision-making, which is why we framed up a newer approach. Next slide. And now we'll start to jump into some more detail about what we know um, on the various sources. And I wanna describe this to you as we've broken up the financial um, recovery into different buckets for us to, to talk through. And the first, um, is FEMA and some of the other uh, federal funding sources, which I'll dive into, the American Rescue Plan, what we know we're possibly getting from the state of California, as well as where our own general fund might be committed. So I do want to dive into the FEMA, so next slide. I think what's important for us to realize is we are still in a transition. And as many of you on the council have pointed out through some of these sessions, um, you've said, wait a minute, we're still responding. And you're absolutely correct. And so in a response, the, the Federal um, Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, is usually the lead agency. Uh, what's been um, a bit unprecedented in nature and scope with this pandemic, it's, it's required way more uh, federal agency and support to combat the, the spread of, of COVID-19 and for state and local governments to be able to stand up. Yet FEMA still does um, cover a good portion of, of what our response is. And it's still providing significant reimbursement for COVID-19 response expenses at 100%, which has really helped us. So the recovery team to date has submitted 
just shy of 25 million um, for expenditures for FEMA for reimbursement and is, and is currently preparing um, a remaining uh, 17.8 million um, around some of these funding pots. So it's important as we continue some of our response, which will will go on for the next several months, um, possibly around PP&E, food distribution and, and temporary housing facilities, by us being able to maximize uh, FEMA reimbursement uh, around the eligible cost, it will free up the American Rescue Plan dollars, state dollars, or any other funding sources um, that can help us with essential services. Um, so we'll be doing this through clear documentation and continuing to work with FEMA, which has been a great partner over the last few months um, in this approach. Um, next slide. I do want to say before we jump off, as the um, as we transition more and more from response to recovery, however, a lot of the recovery programs that we'll be outlining and going over and that we have gone over with you aren't FEMA eligible. So really making sure that we're matching um, and doing this work properly um, with the response items back to FEMA can create additional dollars for us on the recovery. Uh, moving on to the American Rescue Plan um, and a deeper dive into it, I do want to pass it off to Alexandria Felton, our uh, interim Intergovernmental Relations Director. Thanks, Lee. So <clears throat> just to give a little bit of a background on the American Rescue Plan and what it actually is, um, starting at, on March 11th, the president signed a, the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan Act, or what's known as the ARP Act. And the re relief package funds a range of existing programs like the Paycheck Protection Program. It provides stimulus payments to individuals and establishes new programs and funding streams like the Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund. The Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund provides about $350 billion to states, municipalities, counties, tribes, and territories. And that also includes $65 billion in direct aid to cities, towns, and villages. As um, Lee noted earlier in the presentation, a lot of the programs are still under development and some of the funding allocations and guidance is starting to come in, but this is a dynamic and evolving space. Next slide. Next slide. So in March, the Intergovernmental Relations Team distributed a detailed info memo on the American Rescue Plan. And we also provided an overview of the package during the Intergovernmental Relations Spring Update to Council. And we've highlighted some program aspects of this very large package here. And you'll see here in yellow, there are the areas where the city is expected to receive or will receive direct funding. In terms of that specific city assistance, um, the biggest portion comes from the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery fund, as we've mentioned earlier. And um, that's where we'll actually be receiving $212 million. The city will, San Jose will also receive $11.6 million to address homelessness through the Home Investment Partnership Program or HOME. And the city will receive $36.2 million to provide emergency rental assistance. And that money can be used to pay rent, utility and energy bills, and other housing expenses. The airport will also receive direct funding for ongoing operations and funding to support concessionaires. And the library will be eligible for broadband funding through the Emergency Connectivity Fund program. In addition to these benefits, our residents will also receive direct assistance, including stimulus payments, that's the up to $1,400 to individuals, depending on income, an extension of the employment benefits, additional food assistance, expanded child care benefits and tax, cre child tax credits, homeowner assistance, and utility assistance for both water and energy, and finally, expanded health care assistance. Our businesses, as, as we look into what our, as, as we continue to look at sort of the, the broader sort of ecosystem of, of what's received in our community and by our residents, our business, businesses will receive small business grants, more PPP money, which includes 501c nonprofits, restaurant aid, venue aid, and extended tax credits for paid sick leave and paid family medical leave. Next slide. 
In terms of what we know about local funding, our city and our regional and community partners were fortunate to receive federal funding from relief packages like the CARES Act last year and more recently and the American Rescue Plan to collectively address the needs of our residents, residents who were devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic. As we work to assess and understand the funding coming to our city, it's also important to understand what funding our partners are receiving and how they will prioritize their funding. This will help us to better coordinate and collaborate with our partners. For example, we know that the county will receive more than 374 million in their in coronavirus states and local fiscal recovery funds, as well as 3.5 million to address homelessness through the Home Investment Partnership Program, and more than 30 million to provide emergency rental assistance. Also, the state will be allocating funds to health departments for contact tracing, and our school districts can expect state and federal funds for priorities like school reopening, community learning hubs, and meals. Some allocation amounts are still unknown, and we can expect critical support like funding for water and energy utilities to help their customers with unpaid bills and arrearages, or subsidies to child care providers through the Child Care Development Block Grant. Next slide. So interim guidance for the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery fund was just, just released last Monday and the treasury expects to disperse the funds this week. They're working hard to get those funds out to jurisdictions and states and, and local jurisdictions. The funds will be distributed in two tranches with the second half to be distributed in 2022. The deadline to spend the funds is December 31st, 2024. The city is currently reviewing the interim guidance, as we mentioned earlier, and will be engaged in providing feedback to help shape the final guidance that will, will be released in June. The funding objectives include support urgent COVID-19 response efforts to continue to decrease the spread of the virus and bring the pandemic under control, replace lost public sector revenue to strengthen, the, strengthen support for vital public services and help retain jobs, support immediate economic stabilization for households and businesses and address systemic public health and economic challenges that have contributed to the unequal impact of the pandemic. Next slide. So within the categories of eligible uses, recipients have broad flexibility to decide how to best use the funding to meet the needs of their communities. Recipients may use the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds to support public health response. And that includes funds for COVID-19 mitigation efforts, medical expenses, behavioral health care, and payroll and covered benefits for certain public and, and public and health, public health and safety, public safety staff, address the negative impacts to deliver assistance to workers and families, supports businesses, businesses with loans, grants, in-kind assistance, and speed recovery of impacted industries. Also providing premium pay for essential workers, supporting broadband infrastructure, such as making necessary investments to provide, un, provide unserved or underserved locations with new and expanded broadband access, replacing public sector revenue loss, and finally, supporting water and sewer infrastructure to make necessary investments to improve access to clean drinking water invest in, and invest in wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. From an equity perspective, these flexible funds allow the city to focus on the hardest hit communities and families and to focus on the disproportionately impacted areas. Next slide. And key examples of the ineligibility it uses includes net reduction in tax revenue. So if a reduction exists, recipients must demonstrate how tax cuts were paid for from sources other than a coronavirus recovery funds, deposits into, in, into pension funds, that is defined as extraordinary contribution for the purpose of reducing accrued unfunded liability, and other use restrictions that includes funding debt service, legal settlement, settlements or judgments, and deposits to rainy day funds or financial reserves. Next slide. So now we will transition to funding from states that can aid the COVID-19 recovery. City funding that was, in terms of city funding that was received, in addition to the funding that the city received for emergency rental assistance, the state also received $1.5 billion directly from the December relief package, and the state is estimated to receive more than $27 billion from the Amer American Rescue Plan. 
the state has allocated more than $33 million to the city of San Jose for emergency rental assistance. The federal COVID relief dollars and the recently announced state budget surplus present also present opportunities for several city priority areas. The Senate and Assembly have released their budget priorities, which include homelessness and broadband, green economy investments, and early education, and the governor's $100 billion California comeback proposal, which was linked to his revised budget released on Friday, includes $12 billion for homelessness, $5 billion for drought response and water infrastructure, $1.5 billion for the California Small Business COVID Relief Grant, $1.5 billion to clean and revitalize neighborhoods, $7 billion for broadband, and $20 billion for schools. Next slide. So the governor's May revise assumes a projected $75.7 billion surplus. Combined it with over $25 billion in federal relief, this supports the $100 billion California comeback plan. And the total revised budget is $267.8 billion. We are closely watching the budget process to understand what budget allocations we can expect from state programs to the city. We're also working with the city's legislative advocates and legislative leadership to advance the city's priorities through the budget. Following the May 14th release of the governor's revised budget, the legislative budget process is now in full swing with rapidly evolving negotiations in the legislature. The final state budget must pass by June 15th and, and is typically signed by the governor in late June. So that concludes my report. And with that, I will now hand it off to Suma Maciel, Director of the Office of Racial Equity to talk about advancing racial equity through the American Rescue Plan. Great, thank you, Alex. Good morning, Honorable Mayor, Council members, members of the public and city staff. Um, I know it's been shared before, but it's important to reiterate the moment that we're in, an opportunity to transform the lives of people devastated by the pandemic who've been disproportionately communities of color. And as such, we will be relentless in our pursuit of equitable opportunities and outcomes, and we will continue to lead with race. So the next few slides that I have for you um, are really just a refresher of some of the things that uh, we've you know, introduced to you in the past and in recent study sessions and is really this notion of, of leading with race. Um, and so in this slide, which I think you've seen different variations of it before, um, we know that we will have achieved racial equity when race no longer predicts life outcomes. And that means that Communities of color will be just as likely to own a home, graduate from college, have the same life expectancy, live the same number of years, have a stable living wage job as white people. And at the same time, outcomes for all groups are improved. We know that some progress has been made over the years when it comes to equity. Yet if you look at any measure of success, like income, education, health and criminal justice, et cetera, there are significant differences in outcomes based on race that remain deep and pervasive. So this is about taking care of all parts of our community so that our community as a whole will be better off as well as the individuals in it. And as I've said before, we acknowledge that other marginalized identities face disadvantages, but beginning with race helps us develop the framework to address system disadvantaged by other groups as well. So again, when we aim for equity, this means allocating resources towards the people and places who are most impacted and most in need until those places and people are on a level playing field with the rest of society. Next. Um, this is also a slide that you've seen in a, a different, slightly variation of this, but why this is important um, is because local governments like the city of San Jose, we have an important role. We can reduce pain experienced by people who are hurting the most. We're also closest to low wage workers and communities of color who've lost the most during the pandemic. So our path forward will lay a strong foundation to build direct linkages between budgeting and equitable decision-making. We will apply race conscious, conscious approach and ask equity-focused questions and deliver measurable benefits. Next slide. 
So in this slide, you'll see the 10 priorities for advancing racial equity through the American Rescue Plan as recommended by PolicyLink. It is a guide to support cities and counties towards stabilizing the hardest hit workers and businesses and make targeted investments to build an equitable economy. One in which working class people and communities of color have good jobs, dignified and rising standards of living. So coincidentally, the equity worksheet provided by PolicyLink is similar to the budgeting for equity worksheet that we designed that provides a series of questions. Basically, it's a mechanism for ensuring that racial equity is a factor in decision making. And uh, what was nice about seeing this, um, this list provided by PolicyLink is that it reinforces the need to ask the right questions, that a toolkit really is asking the question. So we're constantly going back to who is it that we're trying to benefit? What does data tell us? And how is community involved in providing insight to that data to help design an approach that works better for them? Next. Um, again, so similar to um, you know, what you've seen in the past, this is part of the racial equity principles that we use for budgeting for equity that also mirror um, the, the same set of principles through policy link. Again, the impact is you know, we want to make sure that whatever we design or whatever investments we make are actually have helping and promoting the well-being of the community. Uh, we want to make sure that we have and we're using uh, relevant data to disaggregated by race that helps inform decision making. Um, but mostly it's, it's community voice and centering community voice. Um, like I've said before, I know I sound like a broken record, but data is one piece. It's a tool that helps provide context, but community voice actually does help inform decision making. And then finally, an area that we'll be working on down the road is establishing accountability. So what are those performance measures that we can agree on um, that, we, that will be basically those markers to show us and indicate that we're actually moving in the right direction. So the kinds of questions that uh, we're asking are those that you've heard before. So who's burdened and who's benefit? And for those who are burdened, what steps are we going to take to at least partially mitigate any potential adverse impacts? Uh, we wanna gather evidence to reveal current conditions um, and sometimes that evidence is not um, readily available. So we go right to the source. We go to neighborhoods and we do surveys and focus groups and create a protocol by which we get feedback to collect other types of, of data that's relevant. Um, and we also make sure that we have very targeted engagement with communities um, who need our help the most. And they and give them agency to help design um, how, we, how we move forward. So on the next slide, this is just um, an example of, of how we've done this. So we did, you've heard originally that we did some engagement of the community with our partner organizations related to financial and rental relief. We did that last summer. We did a survey over a course of four days. Um, we received information from almost 300 people in the community. And and with the information that we received, we worked with Destination Home and Sacred Heart Community Services to design a financial assistance program that worked best for the people who needed it the most. So in this example, it's, it's very similar. Um, the Office of Economic Development, with the support of Office of Racial Equity, worked with the Latino Business Foundation on a pilot project to implement a place-based equity approach. And this pilot project was launched in August of last year for the Small Business Needs Assessment in East San Jose, where we centered the perspectives of small business, small business owners. And so a survey was deployed and co-designed with the Latino Business Foundation towards equitable economic recovery. So essentially ways to support and lift struggling businesses is what we're aiming for. What are those ways to be able to support the struggling businesses um, in a particular corridor of San Jose. So what we learned um, as we did with the financial and uh, for financial relief and rental relief with uh, Destination Home and Sacred Community, Sacred Heart Community Services is that partnering with uh, community-based organizations who are already embedded in the community 
um, provides a lot of value through the process. It's invaluable when they have the framing, when they're part of the framing of the survey questions, because they have a much deeper understanding of, for example, in this case, who the business owners were in East San Jose. And so this kind of cross-functional and cross-departmental process offered innovation through a diversity of perspectives and ideas. But the Latino Business Foundation managed all the aspects of the outreach and marketing and implementation of the survey. And what this demonstrated was that this methodology is an important way of, of, of partnering with community organizations. Um, we engender trust in the process respect for lived experiences and place-based understanding of the population being served. Um, so again, just an example of how we could do this in a very targeted approach. Um, and in this case, ultimately, uh, the responses from the survey offered insight into the needs of what business owners wanted and recommendations came out of that, um, such as you know, providing additional capacity building for small businesses, technical assistance, access to federal loans and state grants and engagement with um, businesses, for example, in the Vietnamese business community. So on the next slide, um, as Andrea had so eloquently described at the May 4th Community and Economic Recovery Session, the approach we'll take through the recovery and beyond will be the use of neighborhood mapping and data to inform how we focus our efforts and continually assess our key questions, which are, are people benefiting? Um, is the burden being addressed? Who is in need of relief, support, and government intervention, intervention with limited resources? And so the neighborhood mapping will give us another tool to overlay demographics and circumstances to identify the priority areas for various recovery programs from digital inclusion to rental assistance. And we can use this approach to prioritize areas of need such as places with high rent burden and bring relief to those communities. So one example before I close um, on how this could be used and how it's currently being uh, deployed is that, um, you know, how do we take these recovery programs to the people? Is through this work, the Relief and Rescue Toolkit that the recovery branch has been compiling in coordination with the county. So essentially this toolkit provides information about the array of federal and state programs related to COVID-19 like rental assistance, funeral assistance, and, and other things. And the county is doing trainings with promotoras, benefit staff, isolation and quarantine staff, and case managers who then share and facilitate access to relief programs in a very targeted way. So that's just one example of how not only we are using a, a racial equity centered approach, but also place-based approach to inform the path forward. So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Dolan Beckel. Thank you, Zoma. Good morning, Honorable Mayor, Council Members, members of the public and city staff. I'm Dolan Beckel, Director of the Office of Civic Innovation and Digital Strategy. As Lee mentioned earlier, while the Council approved City Roadmap represents the city's 41 highest priority strategic initiatives, today's session focuses on 18 recovery-related initiatives. Next slide. For the 18 recovery initiatives highlighted here in pink, I will be answering two key questions. Question one, what is the work estimate associated um, of additional costs and staff to successfully deliver the work associated with these 18 recovery initiatives and recover to a better normal with our community? And question two, what is the recommended relative prioritization of this work should now or in the future we face any constraints and need to make data-driven trade-offs? To answer this first question on costs and staff, the assigned department initiative leads for each of these 18 recovery initiatives used a common approach to document community impact, scope, approach to racial equity, as well as the associated cost and staff necessary to deliver on their recovery initiatives successfully. Next slide. As we analyze the 18 initiative needs, we decided it would be both more efficient and more effective to group the 18 initiatives into just seven different groups, which reflect a common thread related to common outcomes, objectives, communities, and or partners. These seven groups are resident relief, small business nonprofits in the arts, child care and education, vaccination, emergency housing, encampment services beautify SJ, 
and the Recovery Foundation. For the remainder of this session, information will be mapped or aggregated to these seven different groups. Next slide. As we would expect, the cost and staff associated with recovering to a better normal with our community is significant. This picture visually represents two different groupings of data. First, the total size of each group of those seven groups relative to one another shown in color. Second, the total size of each recovery initiative relative to one another shown by the individual boxes. So for example, resident relief represents the majority of resource needs across the housing stabilization, food and necessities distribution, and reemployment and development workforce initiatives. The bottom line, which you can see on the bottom line, is the current estimate of projected fiscal year 2021 and 2022 total additional cost and budget need is approximately $153 million with the need for an additional 90 full-time FTEs, full-time equivalents or staff. The current estimate of the subsequent two fiscal years is $65 million while maintaining the need for the same 90 FTEs at least through 2022. So this answers the first question on additional costs and staff to successfully deliver the work associated with these 18 recovery initiatives and recover to a better normal with our community. Next slide. The second question I seek to answer is the recommended relative prioritization of this work. Not to bury the lead, but you may have noticed that the relative prioritization at the bottom of the city roadmap slide has been removed. We decided we needed to individually prioritize the total domain of the work, uh, of all the work associated with all the 18 initiatives and just not the initiatives themselves. We identified there are 57 key work streams as shown here and mapped them both to their recovery initiative and their one of seven groups. It is these 57 key work streams for which the team developed a relative or staff rank prioritization. Next slide. So the team set upon prioritizing these 57 work streams using our weighted shortest job first or WSJF used for the council approved city roadmap as the point of departure and then worked with the Office of Racial Equity to embed a racial equity lens into the prioritization process. Next slide. The 11 additional questions embedded in the prioritization process for racial equity are for community value, how equitable is the initiative? Who is benefiting? Who is burdened? What neighborhoods? Is this serving marginalized communities? Is it intersectional? Are there higher order positive impacts or uplift? For opportunity enablement and risk mitigation, how does this serve an at-risk population? What is the risk within certain neighborhoods in the city? For time criticality, how susceptible is the neighborhood to pandemic inter impact? And what is the current community impact, especially in marginalized communities, if we do not complete this work? Next slide. Applying this prioritization criteria results in the relative stack rank priorities of these work streams shown here with number one being the highest, most critical priority. Really everything on the city roadmap is a high priority and all of these work streams are high priority. This stack ranking provides a data-driven tool to help make choices in the future, should we find resource or funding constraints. So this concludes my section on answering two key questions. Number one, what is the current estimate of additional costs and staff to successfully deliver the work associated with these 18 recovery initiatives and recover to a better normal with our community? And two, what is the recommended relative prioritization of this work? At this point, I'll hand off the discussion on funding approach and initial budget allocation to Deputy Manager uh, Kip Harkness and Budget Director Jim Shannon. Thank you, Dolan. Good morning, Mayor, Council, members of the public. I'm Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager. Building on everything you've heard so far, I wanna lay out our recommended initial approach to funding an equitable recovery. Starting now, we wanna receive City Council feedback during the study session and we will be subsequently issuing a manager's budget addendum or MBA next week to recommend an initial allocation of funding among the 18 initiatives. 
The idea is that we would prepare for the recovery efforts by allocating this initial budget based on your city roadmap prioritization, the 18 initiatives you've identified, and that we would ensure funding for critical safety net services, work streams where the city must lead and execute, foundational work such as planning, hiring, procurement, communications, language, and the March budget message items that you have approved. So this approach we believe allows for flexibility and partnering opportunities. We will rigorously pursue, understand, and unlock additional federal and state funding programs and will immediately initiate planning, hiring, and procurement and other long lead items so we don't miss the opportunity to drive change. This will necess necessitate a rapid and complex transition from the Emergency Operations Center, EOC, to our recovery team. And we have to do this now so we have the teams in place by summer. Next, um, in July and beyond, we will continue to provide critical safety net services, developing handoff plans to partners where possible, and making sure that we don't leave anyone behind. This will give us the time to listen deeply to people and businesses most burdened, to center their work in their lived experience, taking the time as leaders to reconnect with the community and giving our teams the ability to refine our approaches and strategies based on what we learn from our community. We will engage with partners to develop a collective impact approach to recovery that plays to our strengths and their strengths to make sure we have the opportunity and the ability to do something truly transformational. This will develop and launch our equity focused place based recovery initiative that focuses our efforts on who and where it is needed most. We will continue to pursue and understand and unlock federal and state programs to maximize funding coming to us and to our partners. And of course, we will return to council on a regular basis for guidance, direction, and additional budget appropriations, including taking the time to work with council committees and giving council ample and repeated opportunities to set and shape policy and strategic direction in each of the 18 initiatives. Next slide. So here at a high level is what our recommended allocation of the American Rescue Plan funds by group would look like. Residential relief, about 90 million. Small business, nonprofits and arts, about, 100, about 19 million. Child care and education, 6 million. Vaccination would have no separate ARP funding, but would be fully funded by FEMA reimbursable general funds. For emergency housing, about 17 million. Encampment services and Beautify SJ at about 14 million, and then recovery foundational items. That includes communications, language support, and other support services at about 7 million or about 4% of the overall budget. Other items, which include some of the items in the March message that don't directly tie to roadmap items, about a million dollars. So as an example, let me kind of double click on residential relief to give you a bit more detail and a sense of the logic behind our approach and the complexity of the knowns and the unknowns. Next slide, please. So here you see the $90 million residential relief category expanded out into its three roadmap initiatives, housing stabilization, reemployment and workforce development, and food necessities. So let's take a look at some of the knowns and the unknowns in each of these. All of this is within the context of a rapidly rising economy but with an eviction moratorium ending and people benefiting in different ways from that economy. So with housing stabilization, we have six different interconnected work streams that we see as a huge lift, multi-year and indeed ongoing that will benefit from state and federal funding and where our partners, including the county and nonprofits will also be benefiting from that funding and have a very large role to play. With reemployment and workforce development, you see primarily here the five phases of the proposed resiliency core focus on meeting the needs of the city in recovery and the immediate need to get people into jobs and prepare them for the post pandemic work reality. We expect there to be significant sources from the state and federal government that complement this supporting both small business work and workforce development, as well as an array of uh, different uh, partner programs who will benefit there as well. With food and necessities, we are hopefully in a position to begin ramping down as jobs and the economy ramp up. And we see that the long-term federal and state programs can support people. 
There have been significant expansions of key programs uh, such as CalFresh, WIC, SNAP, food assistance, the broad breadth of school feeding that will provide more consistent and ongoing support for people in need of food. But we must be prepared for the effects of the end of the eviction moratorium and the fact that food instability was high before the pandemic and will continue to be high afterwards. So for a closer work, for a closer look at the numbers on these areas, I'll hand it off to Jim Shannon, our budget director. Howdy. So uh, this is a, a, an example of how the um, initial cost estimates by group for the resident relief would be would be shown, um, and we'll um, sort of be iterating this as the manager's budget addendum that will bring back to sort of budget these funds for um, and that will be included in the adopted budget. Um, but we want to make clear um, the different city roadmap initiatives that map to each group, which you can see there. So the roadmap initiatives under resident relief are housing stabilization, reemployment, workforce development, and food and necessities dis distribution, each with the department owner and then each with a specific leadership uh, team uh, for those roadmap initiatives. Um, and then we have the estimated um, dollar amounts per fiscal year. Again, this is really initial um, for the different roadmap initiatives that roll up into this group uh, for housing stabilization. Um, we have, you know, a total uh, two-year um, amount of 60.7 million. Our reemployment and workforce developments of 14.5, and our food and necessities there of 23.5. So this is, you know, our our first cut based on the methodology that uh, Dolan had dis described and the in input from from the partners. Again, these are early days. We expect to iterate these um, as we did, you know, especially for the coronavirus relief fund, you know, a, a year ago. We had initial budget allo allocations, which we ended up iterating several times, most recently just being a couple weeks ago in, in, in May. So we expect to take a similar approach here, uh, but this is an example of where we think we are right at this moment. Next slide. Thank you, Jim. Um, you know, as we've said, recovery is not for us to do alone. Rather, this work must be done with the whole community for the benefit of those most burdened by the crisis, guided by their wisdom, tapping into their potential and building on their deep enduring strengths. I wanna be clear, this is our city and we do know it well. And you as council members know your districts exceedingly well. And collectively at a high level, we all know what we need to do. We all know where we need to do it and who we need to do it with. The what is outlined by the roadmap and the 18 initiatives that you mayor and council have priority prioritized, the who, is with our capable partners to ensure collective impact and with the people who have been most burdened, particularly Latino, Latina, Latinx, and other people of color, as well as women, seniors, and low-income wage workers. Seeing them not only as clients with need, but as partners with strength and potential. Where is predominantly on the east side and areas around downtown, the areas of the highest rates of COVID infection and death, and the highest rates of unemployment and financial distress. But no one alive has ever guided the city out of a pandemic and economic crisis of the magnitude we have just endured. And there is a lot we don't know. What will our partners be able to do and what areas will they choose to lead? And though there is an unprecedented amount of funding, we are still learning how it will be used, who will receive it, and what the processes and procedures will be to effectively use it. We've said that this is a marathon and actually having run marathons, uh, I would say this is more like a series of marathons that we run kind of one every other week or so. So we're looking at something like perhaps 75 to 100 marathons that we need to run together, council, administration, partners, community. We appear to be in the beginning of a strong and sustained recovery, recovery which is good news, but that also means that people and businesses needs will shift rapidly and we will be need to be ready to shift with them and respond together. And as a city organization, we must continue to be fiscally sound if we are to support the lives and livelihoods of the people of San Jose. And that will mean a substantial amount of the funds will go directly to supporting our general fund for, for the fiscal health of the overall organization and to allow us to continue to provide essential services. Next slide. So as we said, we will be recommending an initial allocation that preserves our fiscal strength and allows us to get moving now on all 18 recovery initiatives you have prioritized and 
gives us the flexibility to work with our partners and communities as we shift from response to recovery in the coming weeks. Next slide. In conclusion, direct aid to cities creates an unprecedented opportunity to transform the lives of residents devastated by the pandemic who have been and continue to be disproportionately people of color. The opportunity to drive transformation, transformational change requires a collective impact approach where we and our hundreds of partners from county to schools to nonprofits are aligned and working with the community. And that takes collaboration, intention, and time. Our budget recommendations will allocate sufficient funds to continue critical services such as feeding and rental relief and sheltering that must continue and enough funds to begin the collaborative planning and building the teams for the more transformative work we all desire. This concludes our presentation and on behalf of the team that is doing this work and put this presentation together, we thank you for the opportunity to lay out our initial approach to funding an equitable recovery and we look forward to the conversation and your feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Kip. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, your work in putting all of this together. Uh, thank you. Uh, Suma and Dolan and everyone who has uh, pulled together. I know there's uh, been from many sources, Alex, really appreciate all the, the great work. Uh, let's go to the public first and then we'll come back to council. Catherine Hedges, welcome. Um, good morning, mayor and council. Um, thank you very much for all of your attention to the um, recovery from the pandemic and um, I support the sanctioned encampments, which we coming up tomorrow as well. And also um, I'm glad that we are looking at everything through a lens of racial equity and um, intersectional with racial equity is disability equity and the uh, most disadvantaged in our marginalized in our community are uh, disabled people of color. If we um, can find way in the budget, you know, if not this cycle, next year to fund the Office of Disability Affairs that will help promote uh, understanding of how policies affect people with disabilities, especially disabled people of color. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speakman. Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Thank you very much for these words of uh, equity uh, and, and, and plans and what you can do with its uh, good efforts. It was really interesting to learn and always to me learn uh, really important in things to learn uh, about how we can function as a community. Um, we were working on ideas of equity, ideas of housing rights, um, worker rights, my open public policy ideas that I work on. We were doing all this before COVID-19. So we're just learning how to continue these good practices. Uh, thank you. The ideas of reimagine uh, it came after the George, George Floyd incidents in this time of COVID-19. The ideas of reimagine are based on the concepts, uh, you know, we're addressing how to uh, really question the future of the military industrial technology complex of this country. And, you know, that really has to be considered. Uh, your public safety programs have basically quadrupled in the last few years. You're going to bring it down uh, a bit. So altogether in the past few years, uh, your, your police uh, uh, public safety has tripled, basically. We're dealing with really high numbers. Um, you know, does that mean you're preparing for the natural disaster or are you just tripling your police budget despite the work of reimagine that's possible at this time? Uh, you know, so we really have to negotiate and consider better uh, practices of health and human services. And I know you wanna make those efforts. Let's really do that now. And that's what we can do to prepare for the next few years, our best best selves. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Reginald Swilling. 
Welcome, Reverend. Good morning. Uh, I think this was a great presentation. I, I haven't heard equity and and reach out like this. I think our prayers at Maranatha are, are working. Uh, I, I, uh, the, the challenge before us, I really do appreciate this presentation and, and the work that's coming out of your out of City Hall around this uh, reimagining what our city can look like and how we build back after COVID. We, we, we know that there's people that have the food insecurity and the housing insecurity and the people that we have living outside that stand on every corner uh, with a cup trying to trying to figure out how they can eat and live for the next few days. Uh, if you I, I appreciate where we are in this presentation, but I hope that we can deliver um, uh, 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 we can we can deliver have the funds go towards the people that need the most services and and that it doesn't get caught up so much in the bureaucracy of trying to deliver it that has been historically been a problem when we see something all the monies that that i know too large a section of the monies that's to deliver the services has been in the bureaucracy to try to deliver them instead of getting to the people that actually needs them. Uh, and I think that uh, if, if we can deliver on what you just put out, I think that uh, our community will be economically and socially much better off. Uh, you know, I've been working around the, the, the business aspect of trying to help businesses after this recovery. But uh, I saw that the numbers that you have there, which, are which is a vital component of building a strong community going forward. I do appreciate this report. I hope that we can deliver with, uh, with the eye on equity and helping those that need the services the most. But thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ruth Silvertown. Um, good morning, Mayor and Honorable Council Members. My name is Ruth Silvertown. I supervise the county's OLSC Legal Advice Line and the Alexander Community Law Center's Workers' Rights Clinic. And I see the pain and suffering of low income, mainly immigrant workers during the pandemic with overcrowded housing, poor jobs, lack of quality uh, childcare and affordable childcare. Um, I do wanna commend you again also for the uh, racial justice lens, um, but um, the, these uh, wor workers are very vulnerable. And I ask you to use these funds to strengthen community services like child and el elder care, parks, libraries, healthcare, internet. Uh, make sure these workers have safe working conditions and fair pay, help families keep their home, provide legal aid for renters facing eviction, community ownership models also support people who've been excluded from the social safety net because of their immigration or employment status and remove barriers and provide targeted assistance. And as part of workplace workforce development, promote, promote good jobs that pay enough to support a family. Also provide training, support, and also uh, resources so people know and realize their rights in the workplace and finally, I want to uh, request that you give money to businesses contingent on their paying their wage theft judgments or entering into a payment plan, um, because we don't want jobs where people are cheated out of their wages. Without these strategies, we can provide much needed resources for the communities most hurt by structural racism and too few public resources, and we can speed our recovery by creating good jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, Monte Wright, welcome. Good morning, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. My name is Monte Wright, and I'm a registered nurse working here in San Jose and a member of the Essential Workers Council. As our county reaches a critical mass of people being vaccinated and emerges from the pandemic, we're we're unwilling to go back to a normal that was deeply broken for so many of us. That's why we have joined together with other people who are leaders in their jobs to form the Essential Workers Council. We're united across industries, grocery clerks, restaurant workers, teachers and caregivers, nurses and emergency coordinators on the front lines of our pandemic response. 
to insist we go above and beyond recovery and pave a path forward where everyone has the things we all need, good jobs, homes we can afford, and thriving neighborhoods. Right now, San Jose has the opportunity to do just that. As part of President Biden's Build Back Better agenda, Congress has approved millions of dollars to support our local recovery. The question is, how will the city spend that money? As the Essential Workers Council, we have identified a set of recommendations to guide the city's budget response. Uh, for our health and reliable internet, make sure people are um, providing these services, have safe working conditions and fair pay. We wanna help families keep their homes through rent and utility relief, legal aid for renters facing eviction and community ownership models to prevent corporate landlords from buying up even more of our homes. We wanna support people that have been excluded from safety net programs due to their immigration or employment status by removing the barriers. We also wanna promote good jobs and pay enough that pay enough to support a family. Remember these workers were heroes during the pandemic. While some of them were at home, uh, these workers came face to face with COVID-19 every day. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Scott Neese. Uh, Scott, you're muted right now. We're not able to hear you. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Scott Neese, San Jose Downtown Association. Excellent budget presentation. Kudos to the staff for their uh, budget strategy presented. It's really understandable. Uh, we just cut the guidelines from the feds last week why it's not entirely clear where all the R ARP resources are going yet. But I implore you, to put a priority on the small business recovery, especially downtown. You saw the information last week, sales tax dropped 20% citywide, plummeted 50% in downtown, an obvious metric for defining those most burdened by the crisis. One of the best investments you can make in recovery is in the small business ecosystem. It is where people are going to be hired back first and fastest. It's not only an economic stimulus to our most diverse local communities, it's also a psychological boost too, to see the lights back on in the storefronts and a return to our patterns as we begin to put the pandemic in our rear view mirror. Your focus on having these funds where it will do the most good, invest in your trusted nonprofits and CBOs that will leverage the ARP money with other funds is spot on and do it with a sense of equity, of putting together thoughtful, impactful programs. It's a great strategy. Get these ARP investments out the door quickly and it will save more businesses, help more residents and get our city back on its feet faster. We look forward to a beautiful rebound in fiscal year 21, 22 in downtown and throughout the city. We see downtown in the 57 work streams and we need this priority to show up strong in the budget MBAs next week. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Patricia Mendoza, welcome. Hi, good morning. My name is Patricia and I'm a lifetime resident here in San Jose. And I just wanna urge you to please uh, keep in mind families and children as we are getting ready to lift all the COVID-19 restrictions and reopen our city again. Uh, please prioritize PRNS, our park services, after school programs, support for families, preschool programs at our community centers, our public libraries. All of these have proved to be essential during this time. And so it is important to not forget um, the most vulnerable populations. Um, these are already systems that are in place that work. And so I just wanna make sure and remind you all that it's important to have them properly funded to continue moving forward. Also, um, these programs support families in all aspects of life, including, um, like I said, preschool, affordable preschool programs that are enriching and nurturing for our little ones also supporting the teens 
and just the family as a whole. And I do urge you, and I would love to see um, more support for the preschool programs. Childcare, we all know, and education is expensive. And if we could add more scholarship funds or even see, uh, I would love to see free services for the most vulnerable communities, that would be great. Um, I know that uh, these programs work and right now more than ever are needed. Before COVID, scholarships would be exhausted in certain community centers or locations on the first day they were granted. And so I can not imagine now when we reopen and families are seeking support, um, how thinly stretched these fundings will go. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, Jeremy Burris. Hi, good morning, Mayor and Council. This is Jeremy Barus. I am asking for the city to invest um, in our children by providing investment in childcare, and social and mental support for our youth. As we're uh, reopening and starting to see light at the end of the tunnel, we need to um, make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind and that we're taking care of families uh, in San Jose and investing in child care, mental uh, and social support um, for programs that will help our, our young children um, develop. Um, and as a parent, you know, I couldn't stress this more. So by investing in these programs, it will, uh, the city is standing up for families and children and uh, making sure that we're leaving no one left behind as we reopen as a city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Torres. Good morning, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. My name is. Uh, Mr. Uh, and a member. Oh, there you go. Yes. A um, member of the Essential Workers Council. Throughout this pandemic, essential workers have been risking our lives and those of our families to provide the critical work that we do in keeping the economy running as essential. Workers Council, we've identified a set of recommendations to guide the city's budget decisions to strengthen the community services like child and elder care, parks and libraries, health care and public health, and reliable internet, and make sure the people providing these services have safe working conditions and fair pay. Also to help families keep their homes through rent and utility relief legal aid for renters facing evictions and community ownership models to prevent corporate landlords from buying up even more of our homes. Also support people who have been excluded from safety net programs due to their immigration or employment status by removing barriers that providing and providing targeted assistance. Promote good jobs that pay enough to support a family and provide resources and support so people know and realize their rights in the workplace. If you do as suggested by Mayor Licardo and put 80 millions, uh, million of federal money into the reserve funds and get rid of jobs providing essential services, it would be an incredible insult to those of us who have been risking our lives doing essential work and an insult to the communities that have experienced so much pain lost and lost this month uh, as an insult to our children when we have the chance to do so much better please do the right thing honor the sacrifice of essential workers with the budget based thank, thank you. you daniel uh dale uh augustine Hello, um, my name is Deo Tina Augustine and I'm a family childcare home provider of Mind Builder Center here in San Jose and a member of the Essential Workers Council. Without, without safe and affordable childcare, tens of thousands of workers in our community couldn't go to work. Without us, our families and economy are left vulnerable. When the pandemic hit, 
child care home providers were overwhelmed and confused. We didn't know what this public health crisis would mean for our work, health, and family. But it quickly became clear to us that despite everything, childcare remained a necessity for many families in our community, and we must remain open. And we did. Over the past year, we scrambled to find and share PBE with each other, connected through our union, SEIU Local 521, and supported each other to navigate closures as a result of COVID-19. How, how are we now? We're still here, serving the children, their families, and our community. And because of that, we understand what our communities need in order to recover from COVID-19. We need a budget that prioritizes us for an equitable recovery. Please invest in our community. By strengthening community services such as child and elder care, parks and libraries, healthcare, and public health, help families keep their homes through rent and utility relief, legal aid for renters facing eviction, and community ownership models to prevent corporate landlords from buying up even more of our homes. Support people who have been excluded from safety net programs due to their immigration or unemployment status by removing barriers and providing targeted assistance and promote jobs that pay enough to support a family and provide resources and support people know and realize their rights in the workplace. United, we can get through this and recover together. Thank you. Thank you. Brendan Rawson, welcome. Uh, good, good morning, Mayor uh, and, on, and uh, City Council. I'm Brendan Rawson, Director of San Jose Jazz. Uh, last week, during your budget study session, Chris Burton described how more than 50% of job losses in San Jose between February 2020 and March 2021 have been within the leisure and hospitality sector. This sector provides tens of thousands of jobs and hundreds of small business opportunities for San Jose residents. As illustrated in Mr. Burton's presentation, numerous occupations within this sector are filled by BIPOC, BIPOC San Joseans, some occupations with 70 to 80% BIPOC representation. If San Jose's recovery is going to be equitable, it must directly address the challenges faced by the recovery of the sector of our economy. This task will not be easy. As Mr. Burton described, the path to recovery for this sector and those it employs will take several years. We cannot ask those most hurt by the pandemic to wait several years for recovery. Industry-specific strategies must be developed and acted upon without delay. San Jose arts and entertainment businesses, both for-profit and non-profit, have proven ability to drive economic activity throughout the hospitality and leisure sector. As an instrument for economic recovery, investing in arts, entertainment, and culture work is a cost-effective use of city resources with immediate e economic impacts for those most hurt by the pandemic. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks to all the members of our community for weighing in. Um, uh, we are now at about 11.30. So uh, why don't we take council comments uh, for about a half hour. We'll take a break at lunch. I suspect we'll have uh, extensive discussion here and we'll come back. Um, I'd like to just open with an issue that's come up. I, I agree it's a very important priority, which is child care. Uh, looking at just the really large amounts of funding that are contemplated right now, between the $39 billion in block grants, child care, and the federal side, um, I think the governor announced in the revise 100,000 new child care slots. <laughs> For me, the real question is, you know, how, how can we go get that money for our community? Um, and I'm thinking out loud about, you know, how we could invest in ways that, you know, if we're thinking about the, the better normal, not just the old new normal, but, but a better normal, you know, are there ways we can invest in human infrastructure, like in the way, for example, through the libraries, we had uh, a program, a great program that helped to train childcare providers and get their certification. And then, you know, as we think about the capital infrastructure, we've got a lot of vacant retail right now. Some of that retail may be located in places where uh, there's opportunities to retrofit it to become child care friendly. How, you know, do we have, I know all this is rolling out in real time and we're all trying to react and respond, 
but do we have a sense about um, where the opportunities really are and how we can be best positioned to get these dollars, you know, whether competitive grants or this is just going to be formula funding, we're going to take whatever we get allocated. Uh, Mayor Lee Wilcox, Deputy City Manager. I'll, I'll start and then hand it off to John Cicerelli from an operational standpoint. I, I think our answer is the, where you were trying to get, that exactly is where we're trying to get. And I think childcare is probably one of the, the best examples of why we want to go with an incremental approach because there has been so much funding put at it, um, put towards it. So between, you know, SCOE, all of the other school districts and the state, um, it does really require kind of a thorough approach and trying to understand how that's going to be distributed, whether it is grant and formula. And our current understanding is that it's both of those, um, given the different pots. Um, so we do want the ability to form those partnerships with the county and the other school districts to try and maximize and attach some of our child care needs to, to those sources before going to American Rescue Plan dollars or some of the more flexible dollars. So I think you're, you're thinking is spot on and, and what we're trying to kind of figure out from an IGR perspective and then Parks perspective. And John, I don't know if you have anything else to add because you guys are in those conversations right now. Yeah, no, you're right, Lee. It's uh, oh, John Cicerelli, Director of Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services, also EOC Child Care Branch. Um, so there are a lot of moving pieces out there right now. Now, a lot of it, Mayor, is not approved yet, right? The governor put his plan out there, but it's got to get through that process, and, and we got to see what it is at the end. Um, same thing with the federal dollars coming. You know, we have to figure out how that flows through county the office of ed and, and through the school districts and what opportunity we have there. And I think I've mentioned before, we have a, uh, an analysis going on right now by University of North Carolina looking at this childcare space um, and what our role should be or recommendations about what our role should be as a city in, in the context of everybody else who's a provider out there, right? What is, what is the space and the gaps maybe that the city needs to find or, or fill? But the, um, our Build Back Better model is understanding you know we really think we should be in the business of helping those who can help themselves first right so when it comes to after school care or preschool um, we believe there's a space there for us to be doing those things at no cost to those families who would qualify for our scholarships um, that, that they should be the first ones to be served in the community and so figuring out a way to fund that is part of the equation but obviously like lee mentioned there's a bunch of different streams of money coming along, we just have to figure out how to weave it all together, and we just don't have all those answers quite yet. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. As we think about the dollars that are out there for childcare, you think about all these other areas, homeless funding. Uh, I think it was between the state and the feds about proposed at least twenty-four billion dollars in broadband money. Um, and just going off of the, the May revise again, I know that that could change by June, but. Um, there's a lot of dollars out there, and I can't help but think, you know, and, and thank you, Alex, for the work you're doing uh, holding down the fort because you lost your partner, Ben, I know, to, uh, who, who went on to other opportunities. And um, I know we're, we're trying to fill that position, but is this a time when we should be really thinking about how we can really bolster the number, uh, sort of the bandwidth we have in Alex's shop? And maybe it's, maybe not just... Inter intergovernmental affairs, but more perhaps around grant writing and so forth, so we can really take advantage of the dollars that are out there. Can you tell me a little bit about, you know, sort of Dave or Lee, how, how, Kip, how we're thinking about this in terms of our capacity to go chase the dollars that are there? Yeah, so I, I can start with that, Mayor. Um, you know, and, and the Intergovernmental Relations Program has actually gone through a, a fairly large modernization. You know, we, we did started with a 1.0, went to a 2.0. I think what you're talking about is really that 3.0 that Alex and I have been talking about. And, you know, collectively with KIPP, I think, you know, as we've looked, we're gonna need to engage not only from an advocacy standpoint in Sacramento and DC, like we never have before around, you know, larger infrastructure bills, um, and all of that work, um, coalition building, which takes an awful lot of time, but this, this recovery piece and kind of the more working directly with state and federal agency piece as a part of the recovery is definitely something that we need to bolster um, because as we've spent more time there, even just through March, 
we've been able to maximize an awful lot of dollars. So I think as we come forward with, even if it's a temporary um, staffing model around recovery, we'll need to think about resources around some of this work very purposefully because there's a huge opportunity and also risk uh, of us not getting these funds unless we spend time and attention there. And the yes and that I would put on that is that we are planning to build a small uh, centralized recovery team out of the city manager's office. And part of what that would do is bolster the intergovernmental relations team and, and be going strategically after grants and, and resources like that. Also directing some of the strategy work that we're going to need to, to shift internally. It's really good news, but broadband is a great example where we have so many different streams of funding that we really want to evaluate what we've got going and say, are we, are we putting our money in the right spaces or can we be winding other funding sources down that can replace or even do better than what we're doing? And then be very aggressive in going after the grants on that. And that'd be a combination in this example of not only Jill leading the digital equity work, but Dolan and Civic Innovation coordinated through a centralized recovery team, which is one of those foundational investments that we're asking to make early. Okay, okay, I appreciate that. I know you, you've already got a lot of really busy, <laughs> exhausted people <laughs> doing a lot of stuff now. Um, is there an opportunity to bring people in as well? Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> okay. Happy to talk more offline because I think that I can't help but think that we're going to need to. <laughs> um, this has been a, as you say, many marathons for for many members of our team. Uh, and then, as we think about the time of this allocation, Kip, you described initial allocations, one hundred fifty three million. Um, I assume that isn't something that just goes into our our June decision making and we vote on it. It sounds like we have so much uncertainty about what other resources that may be out there. I assume we're, we're going to sort of bite off the piece that's most relevant for the urgent needs of the summer and then be able to come back and make sort of decisions with the benefit of, of much better information. Is, is that yes, and I think I think Jim can probably describe that a bit better than I did in when I did the initial cut. So Jim, if you can walk through kind of our thinking about that at this point, that'd be very useful. Uh, yes, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. And Mayor, yeah, I think that's essentially what the approach that we want to take. So that sort of um, initial sort of budget slash slash need is what, what we think, you know, we're we're looking at for the, the upcoming fiscal year. I think when, when we come forward, so our one of our, you know, we're still sprinting. Uh, the marathon is, is ongoing, but we're still in sprint mode because we actually need to release a uh, manager's budget addendum to put some of this money in, in the, the budget for your consideration for the June message and, and for council's uh, consideration. So We'll, we'll come back with a um, uh, probably a smaller version of that for the stuff that we know that we can find know that we need to do. Um, we'll have you know a few more days with the American Rescue Plan as, as as part of that and evaluation some other funding sources. So we'll be able to get a little bit closer, but then be able to iterate probably again for the end of summer, early fallish. I would I would I would guess. And we would also making sure that we are leaving ourselves enough capacity. You know we can't budget a reserve necessarily in the American Rescue Plan. So. Um, but we, we know we need to keep resources available to protect ourselves, protect the city from future revenue losses, adverse in, in impacts. We got the $28.3 million of ongoing shortfall that's going to get rolled over into next year because, you know, we're only solving a portion of our shortfall on an ongoing basis this, this time around. So we got to put aside sort of that to build to that overall $80 million strategy. Um, it, will, it will take a couple of, of, of steps to get there to make sure that we have some funding available for uh, adverse general fund Im impacts, and then make sure we have funding to continue the recovery for a multiple year period. I think that funding for ARP runs through December, 2024. Great, thanks, Jim, thanks, Kev. My time's elapsed, so I'd like to hear from my colleagues and perhaps come back with other questions. Councilmember Sparson. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I had uh, some comments and then some questions because today's recovery or this I think it was scheduled for this afternoon, but the recovery session is part of our overall budget study session, right? And so I guess my question is, uh, how do we, you know, equity is supposed to raise people up. It's, it's more than just keeping people from sinking further, right? And, and, um, and one of the things I'm concerned about is how, the people that are suffering the most in our city, we know who they are. 
it's disproportionately impacting Latinos in our city, essential workers in our city. And um, what I'm not sort of seeing clearly, I'm seeing a lot of words about equity, but what I'm not seeing is the connection and how we're investing in neighborhoods that were suffering both pre-pandemic and during the pandemic. And these are the folks that we are going to leave behind, right? Because we're already talking about recovery and we're forgetting that a lot of folks are still suffering right now in a lot of different ways. And so, so I appreciate the food as many, many of you know, I very much appreciate it. I have a lot of food distribution sites in my district um, and, uh, and, and we're out at them and the numbers have taken a, a little bit of a dip, which is a good thing. Um, I'm a little nervous about what happens after June 30th because um, I'm, I'm not a little nervous, I'm a lot nervous. Um, and so I think everybody's just sort of waiting and to seeing what the, wait and seeing what, what the state is gonna do and frankly, what we're gonna do at the city. And so, so what I'm not seeing is the connection between the COVID response and recovery, because we are still in response for a lot of folks in the city. We're, we have to remember that. That and the equity approach in the, the regular budget, right? And I use air quotes because there's nothing regular about the times that we're in. And so how are we investing in those neighborhoods? And so I guess this is a question for, for Dave Sykes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you, uh, or anyone else on how we're doing that. Because remember, equity is we're supposed to lift people up, right? Not just, I appreciate that with the COVID, you know, we're, we're, it's really about saving lives, but we're supposed to be marrying the two. And what's your vision for that? How are we going to do that? What are we going to hear more about where we don't just keep people from sinking, we start to lift people up? Yeah, thank you, council member. So I think I think that takes us back to the roadmap. You know, I know we, we went through a lot of information today and, and we were at a very high level, I agree. Um, and I think we were making sure that we're all on the same page in terms of our strategic approach. Um, and so there's a lot more details that need to be worked out, but it is back to the roadmap and we can bring that roadmap back up and talk about the, you know, the, the priority areas that we've all kind of worked together on with the council to, to, to focus our attention. Um, and then as Kip, I think was, well, and the team was pointing out within each one of those roadmap areas uh, are many, many, many individual strategies that go directly to, um, you know, um, meeting the needs of our community. Um, and so I think the team went through just one example that had actually 47, I think, particular items that, that aligned with that particular roadmap item. So now, I think we're, we're prepared to kind of go through each one of those um, as we move forward, um, but it is very direct, it is very deliberate, it, um, and it's very detailed. Um, and I, I admit that today's presentation was it's hard to kind of get into that type of detail, but um, I don't know, I'll, I'll ask maybe Kip and Lee and, and, and Dolan to kind of uh, provide more information. And remember, this is invest, right? This is, this is the marriage between COVID response and the regular budget where we are supposed to be taking an equity approach and investing in neighborhoods. And that's, that's. Yeah. So fair, fair enough. Council. I mean, so I mean, today's discussion, we, we are, we are uh, focused on has, as I think Lee said, the pink items that are directly um, community and economic recovery items on the roadmap. Um, that's what today's session is focused on. And what we're trying to do is, describe kind of the opportunities with the funding and how we marry that up with, with our, our strategies to meet the yeah. needs. Right. So yeah. that's, I get that's, that. Yeah. I get that. And I, and I guess, I guess what I'm saying then is I need to hear more because this money is intended for communities that and municipalities and communities and folks that have been suffering, right. All of this time. And, and, so we do that through COVID response and recovery, yet we are also supposed to be investing in these neighborhoods, excuse me, in these neighborhoods as part of the regular budget. And that's, I'm not seeing a connection. I'm not, and I'm not hearing a lot of specifics about what the ideas are. Um, you but know, Councilman, 
That's where we, I mean, we, we've kind of, we went through the, the proposed budget, I know, pretty quickly. I know, but based on days. last week and today, right, we're supposed to be marrying the two. These are all budget study sessions. And so I guess I, I'm conveying my frustration in um, not really hearing how we're lifting people up. And so, yeah, so, so that's that's what I'm conveying right now. Yeah, no, so that we'll, I think we'll certainly accept that um, um, and have to kind of think through wh what we need to do to be able to kind of provide that level of detail. Um, I, I don't think there's any doubt that the, the intention here as we're describing is to make sure that we're um, lifting those in the community that need our help the most. That's the strategy here. Um, but uh, I don't know if, if Kip or Lee want to jump in, but I, I hear you. Thank you. What, I, would, I would just add, I, I, I think the team definitely hears you, council member. I think that is, uh, you know, not to go back to, it was hard for us to paint a full picture of you uh, for you guys so that we don't, you know, we, we don't yet have the data to, to get into some of the specifics uh, of what we'd really like um, to do with you. But I think that is our intent. And quite frankly, one of the driving factors and, pumping the brakes a little bit with a more incremental approach. Um, you know, the mayor mentioned um, the ARP money, you know, it can be spent around infrastructure, around broadband for neighborhoods that don't have it and a few others. And so it's a conversation we'd like to have with you. Um, but also the Biden infrastructure bill itself off to the side is starting to take shape. And is that gonna be an allowable use? And so trying to understand those triggers so we can say, this is what we really wanna do for these neighborhoods that's the reason we're saying let's pump the brakes so that we have additional specificity for you to get into more examples of how we want to improve people's lives. And so I, I have a operational question um, because communities are suffering much more than, than not having food to eat, being having a lot of housing insecurity. There's a lot of fear and despair, folks not working. Frankly, a lot of their jobs are going away and, and many of these jobs aren't coming back. And so I'll, I'll have some questions about that. But, but in terms of an operational question, an issue that was consistent before the pandemic, but it's really been an issue during the pandemic as well. And I think it impacts a lot of what we're talking about doing is hiring. And so whether it's been Project Hope or other initiatives, we, how are we going to build our infrastructure so that we're able to fill and hire those positions in a reasonable time frame? Because I'll tell you in some of our, you know, whether it's uh, Project Hope and addressing gang violence, um, it's pre-pandemic. It took a long time to fill some of these positions. And the longer this takes, the more people suffer because we're not out there the way we should be. And, and it's just talk at that point, right? So how are we going to invest in our, in our own ability to hire and fill positions? Yeah, thanks, council member. So, you know, there's you know, certainly we're committed to filling the positions that we have, the vacancies. You know, pre-pandemic was a very different scenario we found ourselves in. We found ourselves in a scenario where we were uncompetitive. <laughs> we weren't able to fill jobs because there were so many opportunities out there. And that's, and, and, you know, and that, I'm talking kind of generically here, but it certainly applied to many of the jobs that we were recruiting. Um, you know, because of our, our deficit scenario, we, we've had to be pretty strategic about how we fill positions. I know in, in the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force and, and, and um, Project Hope, we, we had some kind of unique issues there going on. Um, but we have continued to fill positions throughout the pandemic, you know, albeit strategically. I, I do think that, you know, when we, uh, as we move forward, we are committed to filling all, all of our, our, our vacant positions. Um, and certainly, um, I would be uh, mistaken if I could say I know exactly what ch challenges we're going to face coming out of the pandemic, and and you know how successful are we going to be? What is the you know what is the environment going to be like for filling positions? I think I think most of us feel like we're going to have um, you know more people wanting and interested in, in coming to work for us, um, but you know we'll have to work through that and see how that how that plays out. Um, so how are we going to prioritize those positions so that we don't have 
um, promotoras or child care workers or library work, you know, I'm, these are just hypothetically, right, um, positions that are community facing um, that we're not filling. How are we going to prioritize those positions? And after the response to this question. We'll, we'll yeah, I'm aware. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Members. yeah. Yeah, and I don't know if Jennifer Shembury or even Kip, if you want to jump in, certainly, um, you know, we will be aligned to be able to meet our priorities. I mean, that's that's the good thing about going through the roadmap and, and the prioritization effort that you all allowed us to go through. We're able to prioritize the work. We, we will align the organization around those priorities. That's a guarantee. Um, and that's, that's a positive thing. Um, that way we won't be forced to kind of, you know, all things are equal. Not all things are equal. That's what we're saying. There won't be all things equal. We will be prioritizing, you know, we're focused on the prioritized roadmap items. Kip, you wanted to add something? Yes, uh, thank you. And council member, your question on hiring is actually very, very topical. We were having some internal conversations about this. Part of the foundational investment around effective teams is to accelerate the hiring process. As an example, recently when we needed to hire people to bring uh, go across the county, we had a completely revamp the way we did the hiring process. And we were able to get 75 people, mostly bilingual, hired very quickly. But that was by modifying and making our, our processes more agile. We're going to have to do that with the recovery and prioritize these recovery jobs that we hire because it's actually part of the recovery. One of the reasons that Janet Yellen and others advocated so strongly for city funding is that the folks that we employ um, are really important to the economy and represent a wonderful diverse uh, workforce. So we can't do what we are planning to do without hiring. And we know that that's one of the things we need to do more swiftly and more comprehensively and prioritizing exactly those positions. And we've estimated about 90 of them in particular that are absolutely essential for, for moving the recovery forward, as well as the essential services like librarians and parks and recs folks to provide the staffing. So it's a challenge. Uh, we also, we do have a team working on that. And what you've suggested isn't very much in line with what we, we believe is we need to make that process uh, swifter um, and more effective to get uh, the people we need on board. And once we have an approved budget, we can do that without the sorts of freeze or holding approvals that we've had to do over COVID to balance out um, when we didn't know what the fiscal situation would be. Okay, thank thanks. And I'll, I'll wait till the next round yeah, for my question. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Councilmember Frost. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thanks staff for the presentation. I actually uh, really appreciated the, the focus um, and how we have framed all this as, as actually Councilmember Frost was talking about in regards to how we would address the equity needs. Um, and I'll pick up where Councilmember Sparza left off just in regards to, um, I, I think I'll say it slightly differently. I, I would like to see this level of, of framing and focus on equity um, fully incorporated to our own budget. And I, and I recognize that this is, you know, I'm not gonna go back a couple months in, and be able to frame it this way for this year, but that's really where I think we should be striving to go um, the way that that again we have sort of framed this this specific community economic recovery presentation um, is ideally how our our full city budget um, should uh, should in and of itself be framed as well and and I think that we're you know we're striving to get there uh, but we're, we're not there yet and that could potentially be um, why as Councilor Esparza was talking about on how do we marry those two uh, because there's there's obviously more than just what we're doing with this recovery. There's just in general uh, what we're doing in the city on a on a day to day basis, both pre pandemic and then uh, post recovery. Well, you know, three years from now, when when uh, these funds are, are no longer available, right? How, how have we we married this this effort so then that way we're ensuring that the continuance of uh, the use of our our city dollars um, are being utilized in a way to actually address these challenges that we know that the pandemic exacerbated. Um, so I think this is really an opportunity of a, a hard reset, if you will, where unfortunately during the hard reset, individuals and communities that were already uh, negatively impacted have been disproportionately impacted, but we have uh, an ability to actually do the reset and to, to do so uh, in a way that is better for everybody. Um, and so I, I, I actually really, I do appreciate again that the focus of this presentation um, and where the community economic recovery 
uh, dollars are, are looking to, to go. I also um, understand and, and appreciate that we don't know exactly where everything's going to line up just yet. I, I would agree with what the, the mayor said in regards to ensuring we have enough support on our uh, IGR team, our intergovernmental relations team. Uh, it is going to be important that we are able to uh, benefit from as many federal and state dollars and grants that are out there. Um, and if we're, we're not equipped to do so, uh, then I, you know, it sounds like we're already thinking that way, but certainly I think that that should be something that we want to make sure we're not going to lose out on. Um, and then similarly, I think as Councilman Rose Barza was, was talking about, just as we should be ensuring our IGR team um, is, is adequately staffed to ensure the best recovery possible, um, you know, we have to marry that with our own city staff. And it sounds like Obviously, that's what we've we've tried to to adapt into the budget based on our work plan, and uh, in ensuring that we have the the adequate uh, city staff to be able to to, to help uh, through all these recovery efforts as well. Um, so I, I do believe that staff is uh, has their 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 head obviously in the right place and based on the direction that we've been providing. Um, unfortunately, I think there's a lot more to to discuss as this goes forward because um, we're not going to be allocating all these dollars. Uh, right up front. Um, in driving into a little bit more detail, in the, the slide, it was looks like it's slide 39, um, and it talked about the 57 key work streams for the 18 recovery initiatives. And uh, there was under the, the, the subtitle of the COVID-19 Recovery Task Force, the only item listed was the San Jose Alfresco. And I know that obviously we combined those two um, when we agreed upon our work plan. Um, but obviously the task force is gonna incorporate much more than just the Alfresco program. And then when I look down in regards to the uh, draft initial cost estimate, uh, we have, and that's on slide 53, um, it shows for the COVID-19 recovery task force $700,000 for this coming fiscal year, and then that, and then that's it. And I know, I, you know, I would agree as well that the, the task force initially we're looking at as a, a short-term one year, um, and so funding it at, at that rate is fine. But I'm concerned that is that $700,000 thought of initially just for the uh, Alfresco, and because that was what was listed under there, or what is staff thought on that $700,000, the use of it? Well, I think it was a combination of both some of the alfresco work and supporting the real engagement and development of the task force. Um, not the idea that that would be the total amount that the task force would would help guide. Part of what we've been identifying are, you know, within these buckets, we think each of these buckets are something that the, the, the experience that the task force would bring would be helpful in guiding how we do the allocation. And as we know from leading other task forces, we want to make sure that they have the resources to learn along with us and to be actively engaged. So it's a combination of some of what we know, to know we need to do for Alfresco and some initial estimates on how do we support a really solid and robust uh, task force process that we would imagine would also include going out to the larger community and doing more in-depth listening sessions and bringing that back into the task force. But again, it's sort of the initial cut to get started, not the totality of what we think uh, would be the recommendations coming out of that, which is part of, again, to loop backwards to what, back to what Lee said, why we want to not allocate everything yet, because we still need to hear from folks, including the task force, before we begin to make those allocations and partnerships. Okay, do you have a breakdown of, of what you were thinking for Alfresco on that out of that $700,000? I'm sure somebody who knows better than I does, uh, but I'm not sure that we ha I have that at this this level yet. Um, so I'll maybe to either Dolan or Jim to help me with uh, the details on that. Yeah, so uh, currently um, the San Jose Alfresco was allocated into the small business nonprofits and the arts group. And um, looking at the number here, which is why we need to iterate, it looks like it's it's 700,000. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the early portion of that was um, funding for um, parklets and permit in, in inspection fees, as well as um, uh, some other miscellaneous costs to promote the Alfresco program. It sounds like it's the whole amount though, which would mean there, there was essentially zero that we had allocated towards the actual task force itself, based on what Dolan just said. Correct. 
So, so we're, we're driving into that detail of 47 work streams. So the, the, some of the effort around mobilizing the task force is part of the CMO recovery team, and it shows up in effective teams. Uh, and then there's the direct al fresco, which is the 700,000 that shows up in the, in the, in the uh, small business um, group. Yeah, and our, our initial discussions, and thank you for correcting me where the things show up, our initial discussions were we would need um, a, a portion of money, probably a couple hundred thousand, to support the engagement work around the task force, um, but we have not uh, vetted that out, which is part of what we would be doing over the next weeks and months, but we have talked about and realized that that funding would be significant. Part of that's parked in the teams at this point. Thank you for getting me in the correct place, Dolan. And part of that we would need to think about probably drawing from the streams that would be informed by the task force work. So um, uh, apologize for misleading you at first, uh, a council member, but I think we're getting a little closer to it here. Okay. Yeah, no, it's helpful. Um, and similarly, I know the arts are listed within this category and, and it, it doesn't quite detail, I'm assuming under the small business recovery because that's where they were listed as well. Um, what kind of funding are we looking at? Do we have that, um, any, any more granular details uh, within that 17 or kind of 18 and 18 million over the two years? We, we, we do, and Jim, I think the question here is just, the, you know, we've, we've illica indicated things at the initiative level, and we also have the work stream level. Um, and so, Jim, what's, I, I don't know what the best way you want to approach the uh, kind of communication about work at the work stream level. Yeah, yeah, and I think what we would we would want to do is so as part of our MBA that we would come back with would would have a little bit more specificity for the the, the current fiscal year, and I think that um, you know part of part of that bucket needs to include some pretty decent funding for the arts program. You know, we had um, some, you know, it should you know it always could have been more, but we did have some specific allocations in the CRF fund for the arts programs, and we would come back something. Uh, uh, with a similar approach for the American Rescue Plan fund, I know that the the, the TOT you know cultural grant funding has just been absolutely hammered, and so we would expect to try to backfill at least a portion of that um, within this category. And we'll 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 come back with something a little bit more specific uh, for that as part of our M MBA. Okay, so be on the lookout then for some more details in that regard. Okay, um, those are my questions for now. Thanks. Okay, this would be a good time then for us to break for lunch. Uh, why don't we resume at uh, 1.30?